these trips telling to me I'll guard it with you Under neon sky, secrets pulsing their glow But I'm on the night shift, I'm on watch with a view Those lights ain't planes that much I know When the night falls, it's like this Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. I've always been fascinated by the experience and the exploration of human consciousness. In particular, the amount of overlap there is between the way that we understand consciousness and the UFO phenomena. As far back as you care to look, from ancient cultural interpretations of contact between humans and superior beings, or even more recent examples of the abduction phenomenon, contactees or experiencers, there's always been this tie, this strange connection between consciousness and the UFO phenomena. Carl Sagan and many other scientists uh, are holding to the notion that the only reality that exists is this physical world and that anything beyond that, to say it exists, you have to have a piece of dinner plate off of a UFO or something like that. And I'm saying, no, there are realities that are just as powerful, just as real as this one. That other cultures have known this mm -hmm. besides ours. Almost a and, spiritual dimension. Well, or at least something, at. as the abductees put it, another realm beyond the veil, they say, which mm -hmm. is now entering into our world. So we really have no category in, in our culture. We're opening to it now uh, for something that comes from some other dimension, but manifests physically in our world. So I was really excited to get an opportunity to sit down with someone who is a subject matter expert in both worlds, talk about what one can tell us about the other. And I'm talking, of course, about Daz Smith. Daz Smith is a highly regarded expert and historian in the field of remote viewing. He is the publisher and editor of Eight Martini's State of the Art Remote Viewing Magazine. He covers the latest advancements in remote viewing protocols, applications, and analysis. Smith has also established several prominent information websites dedicated to remote viewing. With extensive research on the CIA Stargate archives, Smith possesses a comprehensive understanding of the material covered in the released 91,000 pages of government remote viewing programs. His authorship includes notable works such as CRV, Controlled Remote Viewing, Remote Viewing Dialogues, Remote Viewing 9-11, and Surfing the Psychic Internet. As one of the most sought after remote viewers, Smith's accuracy and artistic representations of locations and individuals have garnered significant acclaim. With experience performing sessions while standing and writing on large canvases, he has worked as a project manager and viewer for renowned operators and researchers in the field of RV. His contributions include collaborating on over 200 missing person cases for a dedicated group and currently working for the Future Forecasting Group a remote viewing business catering to a large subscriber base for financial markets, cryptocurrencies, mysterious targets, and global news events. In addition to his work in remote viewing, Smith is also an accomplished graphic designer, artist, photographer, video editor, and a hell of a nice guy. I hope you enjoy this interview. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. It doesn't cost anything and it really helps the channel. Don't forget to like and share this video. Now enjoy the interview with Daz Smith. I'm so excited to be able to pick your brain. Um, Should be fun, yeah. My interest is, is primarily in the UFO topic. That was my kind of my way in. But in researching that over a number of years, you, one can't help but come into contact with remote viewing in a big yeah. way. How do those worlds overlap? And what can one tell us about the other? Remote viewing is like a, a natural intuitive ability, um, which can be enhanced by training and practice over years. Uh, and this ability can perceive and retrieve what we call multi-form information. And this information is independent from the remote viewer in time, space, and dimensions. Um, and all the projects we do as, as what we call remote viewing are under what we call a scientific protocol, which means they are planned, they're blind, they're recorded, and there's feedback to assess accuracy. Um, and that's what differentiates it really from all other psych like psychic practices. So it's the structure of the protocol and the, the formal processes involved that make it something that's a little bit more reliable and predictable. Absolutely, yes. I mean, yeah, I'm quite fluid in this in that yeah, there could be a person that uses tarot cards, for example, or... Uh, but as long as they do it within the, those protocols of planned, blind, recorded, and feedback, um, then they can class that as remote viewing. 
Um, it is not, it isn't anything more specific than that. Other than, you know, there are, you know, a lot of us do practice what we call a certain type of methodology, which did come out of the, uh, the CIA, DIA, military kind of, uh, work with remote viewing uh, at SRI from 1972 to 1995. So we do commonly use what we call methodologies, uh, which all stem from one called controlled remote viewing, really. Um, so there is that aspect, but you know, I'm happy to accept anyone that uses anything as long as they use those scientific protocols. Well, that, that was uh, dovetails nicely into uh, my next question, which was to what extent, uh, I understand at Stanford, Research Institute, uh, yeah. Hal Putoff was involved in Russell Targ and some of that early work. Is that true? Correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It, it was started by Hal Putoff, uh, who then uh, straight away uh, got Russell Targ involved. And then later on, they had other luminaries like uh, Dr. Edwin May, uh, and, and he ended up uh, controlling the program from, I think, it's around about 1986 to uh, 1995 when it ended but the entire program itself went from 72 to 95 um continuously so you know we're talking 20 i think 23 years and over that period of time it was an approximate uh tune of something like 22 million dollars was spent on the program which is insignificant when it comes to looking at secret black projects but you know a fair chunk when you when you think about you know the research that was done it, it certainly indicates that it was effective enough to keep keep working on it for absolutely. 20 years. You know, because because remote viewing does has have its detractors and skeptics, um, but you have to look at the fact that the remote viewing program itself had to go through several layers of oversight committees every single year to prove it's worth and get funding for the next year, and we're talking about. Um, uh, human use oversight committees, scientific oversight committees, congressional oversight committees, and then each client, you know, we're talking clients like the DIA, the NSA, and so on. They also had their oversight committees as well. So it had to pass muster on all of those year on year to get funding to go on for another year. And, you know, we all know that that just wouldn't have happened if they weren't producing uh, valid uh, data that could, could be used for Intel purposes. Was this research uh, at SRI related to or dovetailing off of the other research going on at the time into uh, telepathy and telekinesis? And yeah, or is this, in other words, was this all happening under one umbrella, or or was this a separate offshoot? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, to be honest, it was a bit archaic back then. I'm a bit of a historian on on RV history. Um, I had the entire. CIA Freedom of Information Act archives that they released, which is 110,000 pages of data. So you can imagine how big it wow. is. Um, as well as, you know, there's other stuff like uh, the Ed May records that are out there now at Rice University. And the University of West Georgia has got the Ingo Swan archives uh, and many others as well. So there's a huge wealth of information. To be honest, there were multiple programs going on and multiple avenues of research by many different you know, avenues, we're talking Navy, Milcom stuff, Intel stuff, all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, for example, the NSA, everyone looked into something along these lines at one point or another over over the last 50 years. Uh, and were those programs happening independently of one another, or was there any, I mean, as far it's, as you know? Sometimes there were connections, and sometimes, you know, uh, people were involved in multiple projects and they had communications. But because a lot of this stuff was is what we call black projects and, you know, special access projects, a lot of the time it was re repeated work and they didn't have access. And, you know, it does get quite complicated when you try to delve into the true history of, of, of what went on. Yeah. But uh, so to, to button this um, history up a little bit, you're saying that remote viewing is differentiated in the methodology that's applied that, that makes it consistent, repeatable, and testable, in yes. other words. Yes, yes. You know, the fact that, for, for example, that all remote viewers are blind to the target, that, that means, you know, when I, when I and many other remote viewers do our work, we're, we, we have no, nothing about the target whatsoever other than a random number that's assigned to it. And that's almost really for admin purposes, just for us to, you know, as a reference point, say, oh, let's work on projects. X, X, X. Um, so all we're given is a random number. 
uh, and we're not even allowed to have anyone in communication or in the room with us or when we're doing our psychic stuff just in case any kind of you know weird body language or something goes goes on to effect oh so it's to me as a, a means of insulating you from any Yes, yeah, we're, complete, we're completely, you know, you, when you're doing remote viewing, you should com- be completely blind. No one in the vicinity you know is the target should be anywhere near the remote viewer whatsoever. So we know nothing at all until the entire project's finished. And then, if you're lucky, you may be given a little bit of feedback. You know, they may say, by the way, this is what you were you were looking at. But not in all cases. D- does it matter that there is, I know you said the number is more for clerical purposes, but does it matter that the number exists? Like, in other words, if the con- if the tasking was just in the mind of the person that you're working with, would no, you still be it. able to do it? Yeah, uh, as, as long as it's recorded somewhere, you know, and that's why the scientific protocols there that whatever the target is has to be written down somewhere so that, and that's what we call the feedback, so that when when I've produced my ten or twenty pages of information. And we've everyone said, okay, the project is now finished. You can then take my 10 or 20 pages of information and look at that against your written, what you want the target to look at to see how accurate I was. But, you know, to answer your question, the numbers don't, don't, don't matter. So sometimes when people give me numbers, you know, can you work project one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? If I can't remember the numbers or something, because, you know, I may be on the train home or something. I'll just I'll just make I'll just use whatever the day's date is and say okay this is in reference to that target you set me and it always marries up or for example there are ve- there are quite a few examples out there and I ran a couple of projects myself on this where to see the limitations of this and what the remote viewer could do I made up a, a fictional UFO event in my head so I said okay you know a, a triangle shaped UFO. Yeah, I can see it in my head. It's going to come down in the field next to my house. A little gray alien and a little six year old girl with blonde hair are going to come out of it. They're going to walk down some steps. They're going to wave, get back in it, and then it's going to take off again. Um, and it only existed in my mind. Uh, and on, on, I wrote it on notepad on my computer to keep a record of it. Um, and then I set that tar. I gave, I assigned it a random number, gave that random number to 10 remote viewers. Uh, and all 10 came back describing a UFO event, and they even described and drew triangle-shaped craft and everything. Wow. Yeah. So, Which is, but it's also a bit of a problem in that because remote viewing has no limitations, we have to be honest in what we do with our projects and the way we you know, present our projects in that because there are no limitations, there is, a, there is a, the possibility that sometimes uh, the remote viewer might be getting the information they're getting from the minds of anyone involved in the project, like like for, like for example, the project tasker. You know? Right. And so it, might not, it, it could pollute the information pool that you're accessing in some yes, way. Or yes, it's, it's, yes, yes, yes. That's why the more feedback you have, the better, because then you can assess it for true accuracy. Um, but we have to be honest that be, you know, because remote viewing it seems to have no boundaries and the SRI program also could not find anything that could hinder remote viewing. Um, we have to be honest that there is that possibility that sometimes or even all the time, the remote viewer might not be getting true data about a target. He might just be getting what the tasker wants them to report back to him because that's, you know. So you have to be very careful in that you have to try to work with teams of people and people who assign you targets that don't have str- very strong opinionated set opinions in their mind, you know, that they are open to, to the actual real truth about targets, you know? So, you know, they're not like, if, if it were a UFO target, they're not like, I know this is real. I know it's real. It happened this way. It can't be anything else because that would possibly pollute the target, the target data or it has the potential to anyway. That's really fascinating, and it, it it sort of suggests that there is a um, a discernible geography to the mental realm that certain things will happen consistently if you have a a, yes. a, a protocol in place. Yes, would you say that's true? Oh yeah, there's definitely there's definitely some kind of very strange um, structure to the universe. Because yeah, you know, and another thing I need to say right off the bat is. Um, they they studied this from seventy two to ninety five, and they could not at that time 
find the mechanism for how remote viewing works and we still haven't found it since i think the closest science can come up with uh it looks like you know theories like the holographic theory of the universe and um quantum entanglement i think that comes close and it might be something along the lines of, of that but we still so we still don't know to this day how how remote viewing works but you know like that doesn't stop us from from using it to a to a certain degree but it, it, it the fact that it works at all seems to suggest that consciousness is at least non-local or you well, can you can send it from place to place no uh i think information is non-local um because again you know i've i've read and seen hundreds of thousands of remote viewing uh target sessions now that people have done over the decades and i've done you know tens of thousands myself uh, and there's no there's no evidence anywhere that a remote viewer actually travels anywhere. So, for example, if my if someone sets me to target to look at uh, the Cydonia pyramids on Mars, for example, there's no evidence that any part of me actually travels to Mars to get that information. I think all the information about that is actually within me and all around us, you know, because all information is everywhere in the universe. So, okay, that that. I follow what you're saying. I think what uh, confused me a little bit is the language. I listened to some um, great interviews with Ingo Swan, and, and it talked yeah. about him going to these places. And I think yeah. the, the language that was used kind of colored it like you're actually projecting. Yeah, there's no, I mean, there's no evidence anyone ever, tra- you know, we haven't found a way to, I guess, measure it, but there's no evidence anyone ever travels anywhere. Um, yeah. So, but you know what we do individually as 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 uh, as individuals in, in in like the psychic process, we sometimes create our own kind of ritualistic kind of ways of doing things. So you know we may we may like envision our you know envision ourselves like trying to project out there to get you know somewhere to get to the target, just as a ritual type type thing to to get us yeah going kind of thing. It sounds like. Um... Well, before I, I have a number of follow up questions to that, I'm just curious what when we say feedback and you get feedback on the on these sessions, what kind of accuracy is possible with these techniques? Um, uh, most remote viewers, if they're good, um, and you know, it, remote viewing is like any skill in life. To be honest, um, there are people you know, natural ability helps. Um, and there's only, there's is I I think the stats show uh, less than one percent of the population are what we call good or world class remote viewers. Um, I would say the accuracy. Uh, I mean, I I can only go on like my accuracy and people I know really. The accuracy of myself is generally eighty five plus percent accurate the majority of the time. Other than um, my database accuracy, long term over future targets um targets that, that haven't happened yet drops to around about 65 percent accuracy so if i tell you 10 things only six and a half of them are going to be on target and that is just so people understand that's you take the remote viewing data that you gather and that's becomes part of a tableau of other data correct that is like used to cross-reference against everything else like so it might be remote viewing data and then satellite data used to confirm it or something uh, like that. It could, yeah. It could be any kind of data, you know, for example, uh, I work in a group, uh, a business called future forecasting group. Uh, we've been going since 2018. And one of our things that we do every month for our subscribers is we look at, uh, we look ahead a month and tell them a, a month in advance, what's what the top news stories are going to be the following month. And consistently over the last five years of that, uh, my accuracy rating, and that's what I database, my accuracy rating on that is, is 65%. So six and a half things I tell out of 10 every month turn out to be correct predictions. That's really interesting. So it's something that you you can build a data set going back as far back as the project's been going on. Yeah, right? so. yeah. I mean, the more remote viewing you do and the more you database it, the more you know about your accuracy. Um, there are people out there that have... A database every component that they've they written down on a sheet of paper for years so they know for example that on colors they're 90 percent accurate on shapes and textures they're 15 percent accurate their sketches might be around about 90 percent accurate so you can 
if you really work this as a business and if you use things like AI and models and um, databases and stuff, you can pick the right remote viewers for, the, for the, the target job that you want to look at. You know, it's not worth putting someone on a target, for example, to try to find a missing person if, if three of the people that you're thinking of using have only 15% accuracy at finding people because they just can't connect to people very well. I see. So that's interesting because that reminds me of, uh, is there a classification system that sort of ranks by skill level or ability uh, so that, I mean, is that, is that a standard thing? Yeah, just- no, no. And, and to be honest, not a lot of people use the database system either. Uh, I only know several that do. To, to, and to be honest, because, you know, like if I do a target for, for a person, I'll produce, say, t- you know, on average, if they if, um, if I do one pass at the target, probably about 10 pages. But if they get me to, you know, if they say you miss something on page six, go back and do more and stuff, which they can do. Um, on some On some projects, I could produce, 30 40 sheets of a4 paper and sketches and it could be like several hundred pieces of information now myself as a remote viewer the worst i I did try it for for about a year of you know taking those hundred sheets of paper and then putting every single word into a database but what i found uh, as an individual is um that was so boring it started to kill my creative remote viewing process because you know you'd finish your rv session and think oh i've now got to spend two days putting that into a database uh, so the paperwork yeah yeah uh, and yeah. anything like boredom um it, boredom it, where the novelty goes massively impacts the quality of the data that the remote viewer uh, gets back to you as well so you have to look out for things like that you know just day-to-day stresses and boredom all kinds of stuff like feeling ill needing to use the toilet for example or just feeling hungry for example before you do your rv can massively affect uh, the uh, the outcome of the data you get from a remote viewer i, I see so in, in, in many ways it's like any any other like you said talent or ability someone has if you can get into the zone the more easily you can get in there and stay in the zone the more yes. effective you're going to be Yes, but we don't go into any kind of like uh, weird transfers or something. So when I do my RV, it used to be on paper with a pen, but nowadays I use a, a tablet because it's just mm-hmm. easier. Uh, so I just sit there with my tablet, a uh, cup of coffee, um, and I, I, I play some music. So I have my phone playing soundtrack from Interstellar because it's just, it's just nice. Um, and I, yeah, I just like repeat the numbers th- 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 for the target and then just, you know, get myself into the zone. And for the next hour, that's, that's just, just what I do. I write and scribble, describe, and move myself around the target. The thing about remote viewing is it's, dif- it's different than most classical psychic techniques in that, because I trained in a lot of those as well. You know, I started my, psych- my psychic journey from the age of 10, and I, I, I trained in all the classical psychic techniques from the age of 15 onwards. Uh, and, you know, we're talking things like clairvoyance, clairaudience, channeling, healing, mediumship. What you find with most traditional uh, or what we call classical psychics is that they generally only hone one skill. So like they, they can, they can clairvoyantly see stuff or they're like an empath. So they can clairvoyantly uh, feel stuff about people or they can hear stuff. You know, they can be clairaudient and they hear voices and stuff with remote viewing. It's different in that we have. Uh, we have all that available to us. Every sense is available for us to use within remote viewing. So we see, uh, uh, it's a bit of a misnomer because, you know, it's got the word remote viewing. And the majority of the information we get isn't viewed. It's it's internal feelings. But we can at times see the target, but we tend to more feel the target, smell the target, taste the target. And then we can do other things like move around the target. So if I sense their structures at the target, you know, or I'm doing a sketch and it's my sketch looks like their structures, I'll give myself commands. I'll say, because I'm in control, you see, I'll say to myself, okay, I feel there, there's a structure here on the page. Let's move 50 feet inside there and then describe what I see. Or I can say, let's move 50, 500 feet above the structures. And the moment I do that and write that on the sheet of paper, I get all the information for what's available 500 feet above the structures, and I quickly write that down as fast as I can. So as, it's a control thing. As you are experiencing that internally, how does that, how does that feel? Do you feel as if you're actually there getting it all in real time, or is it bits and pieces separated, or is it more like flying a drone and looking at the screen and, and seeing it that I think. Way? 
I think all those would apply, uh, and every one of us is an individual, so we're all different. Uh, for me personally, uh, the majority of the time, uh, I don't feel like I'm there at all. It's just pure information. But that might be just a way I've taught myself to process the information. I have to be honest. I think we all individualize this and, and create our own reality for how this works. But for me, like uh, it's hardly ever visual. I do see visuals, and I and I draw those and sketch those when I do get them. But for me, it's like if I say to myself, "Okay, uh, taste the target," I don't actually get any internal impressions of what the target tastes like, you know. But I get, I know what the correct word for that taste would be. I see. So the first word that pops in my head would be like metallic, rough, you know, gritty, hard. I get these words coming to my mind and I've learned over the years to trust these words and the first impressions mm. and not, not the counter them and writing them down. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm like asking myself, uh, what do I hear at a target? And I'm writing, oh, I hear rustling wind. I hear a repetitive thumping noise. I don't actually hear any of that. It's just, I know from deep in here, it's a very subtle feeling. I know that that's the correct interpretation that I should be writing on the, on the paper. How do you know what you're perceiving? How can you separate or differentiate that from what you might be imagining? And how do you, in the moment when you're doing it? We do have tools. Um, in the process that I use, uh, and I use it like an adapted form of what we call controlled remote viewing. And that was created by um, Ingo Swan uh, mm -hmm. for the military based on his own internal processes of uh, processing information. Um, and essentially, it does have tools to to understand uh, how your analytical or kind of ego and imagination process works as information comes in. Um, and essentially, when you start naming things, um, you we then slightly we put them to one side. We call them analytical overlays or AOLs. We don't throw them out, but we move them to one side and classify them for what they are. For, so, for example, if I was doing a target and I, was, and I was getting data and it was like, oh, this feels like it's hard, feels like it's solid, feels like it's gray and metallic, feels like it's a boxy, man-made structure. And then the next piece of information or a picture in my head go, uh, is of a shop, for example. Um, I, would, I would put that to one side because I've now gone ahead and named it based on the information that's come in. But it's more like a guess because my, my mind's building up a picture. It's seeing, you know, I'm writing core, cool, hard, square, man-made structure. And my head's, all the time you see, we got this thing within us, this ego that wants to please. So uh, there's this little angel sat on your shoulder inside of you going, it's seeing all this data coming in. It, it, trying to, it just jumps to a, a conclusion of, uh, the first time it can, which is your imagination. Um, but that imagination is the majority of the time not entirely correct. It's not entirely wrong, but it's usually not entirely correct. So we just move that to one side and maybe go back and have a look at it later to try to get the uh, the signal from the noise, you know, the real information out of it. So we have we have processes like that to try to see as the data is coming in from us and how we're write, writing it or reporting it on paper, uh, where the mind might be trying to jump in with imagination. Do you get a um, higher fidelity? Oh, I don't know if anyone's looked at this. I imagine somebody must have. Do you get a higher fidelity picture of what's going on if you increase the number of remote viewers that are working on a particular project? Uh, yes. I ha uh, And I think that uh, a lot of people have come up with the same conclusion. On that. I haven't seen any hardcore science to prove it. Um, I always work with teams. I always employ teams um, because, you know, we all have... We all have our different kind of viewpoints on the world as well. And what we have found as well is that how you are as a remote viewer is also reflected by your life experiences and your life skills. So, for example, uh, I've always spent my entire life as a, as a creative, so a graphic designer and an artist. So I can pick up any kind of pen. I can pick up any medium and and just draw with it you know and paint anything with it so for me sketching in rv is is you know it's pretty easy but there i i've worked i work with some people like engineers and stuff they're not so, quite so fluid and so good at doing that kind of stuff saying that if the target were to look inside uh, a vehicle to see how an engine would work they would probably be better at that than me because i have no idea what i'm looking at with an engine and the same with 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 people you know, if, if you 
if you have a doctor or a medic or a nurse on your team, if you're looking inside a human body to see what what ill you know what might be causing an illness, I report it as oh look, there's a big red blobby thing here in the middle, whereas they they can accurately describe it better better than I can. Sure. So to be honest, the best te- yeah, teams would be best, and the uh, I've said this before, the ultimate team would be a team that would have a scientist, engineer, uh, you know, an artist a psychologist and so on. You know, if you have one of all those on there and they were all good remote viewers, you have, you would have the, the kick-ass ultimate team of remote viewers that could do anything. That's really interesting. And, and I wonder if you, if you increase, let's say you had five remote viewers working on a team, if you go from five to 15 or five to 25, do you get more useful information or do you just get more of the same information? I would, uh, there's lots of variables involved in that. I would say, if if the 15 remote viewers weren't all aces, then I would say it would actually be worse data because then you have 20 pages for 15 remote viewers. And if 10 of them are subpar, meaning that, you know, only 51% of their data is accurate, then, then you start getting a lot more uh, noise to signal. Mm-hmm. So you have to be very careful that, yeah of you know the quality of of the, of the remote viewers that you you use in 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 the in the projects if you can yeah i guess uh just to take that one step further though assuming they were all skilled and 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 had reliable history uh, yeah past a certain point of of reliability i guess and you yes. were to get a big enough group together do you get more out of that you or probably is there a point would. of diminishing returns i guess yeah you probably would i i don't think it's viable really though to be honest uh, because of the amount of data that comes through it's just like for example i i work i i have a, a group that i work with i don't know if you've seen any of this stuff uh, we have a group called the health Hour club uh, i've seen the group in in my research yeah uh, yeah but i don't I, i'm not too well read into it okay it's a group of remote viewers that i personally curated so i seen people online how skilled they were then i asked them if they'd want to join the group and i think we have about eight of us so far i think that's a good number but you know i purposely went out and found or trained people to a level where i felt that they were very good and competent enough on a regular basis to produce data but for example if, if i if we're doing a project through hellfire and let's say i'm the project tasker on it so i'm not remote viewing but seven others are they might each give me a hundred sheets of paper, mm. you know, which might have a thousand impressions on it per person for, you know, for seven of them. So that's 7,000 data points. Imagine trying to do that for, you know, 15 people, 25 people, sure. you're talking 25,000 data points. So it, it, project management wise, it starts getting too cumbersome. If you have too many working the targets, do you think, just and I'm I'm asking you to speculate a little bit, but do you think that um, agencies with a unlimited budget or a less restrictive budget and the manpower to oversee a project like that have done that in the past? Um, I haven't seen them do it in the Stargate days, um, and there are rumors that people are still doing it now. Uh, I would say, with the technology we have nowadays, you know, with AI and stuff, you uh, and I, we may even go down that route ourselves sometime in the future. Um, if you could get AI or supercomputers to evaluate data sets, um, y- yes, uh, it, would, it would be easier and more valuable to do. Absolutely. I think it, one of the hardest things in remote viewing, I think, is, is to try to get a computer or, or AI to analyze sketches because I don't, you, you know, I don't think they're mm. quite there yet where you could take a sketch. And to be honest, sketches in remote viewing, in my opinion, hold quite a bit more information than the words you know it's, it's like the the old adage you know a picture is worth a thousand words kind kind of thing um, it's almost like what you're describing it sounds like the information that's coming in is coming in below the layer of language and then the brain yeah. applies language to it to try and like yes, convert it absolutely. into some data yeah. so so it's like things are getting lost in translation and you're trying to minimize that yes yeah, oh, absolutely. Data comes in through us as a remote viewer, and we're using our own internal language, which is built up over you know decades of our personal experiences, to try to find a way to interpret that signal into into words uh, and pictures. Yeah, and sometimes we get it wrong. But what we have found as well is that 
the more we train ourselves individually on and expand our vocabulary of words and and all kinds of stuff and sensations and we're talking memories as well Mm -hmm. um uh, the more we uh expand our personal vocabularies the better we are uh, at describing targets so i when i teach people i run them through these exercises especially when i'm teaching them to look at sensories uh, things like touch and taste and smell so i get them that when they're out for a walk for example to and you know i'm here now with my microphone here and stuff is to touch things on purpose and try to think about what you're feeling as you're touching it you know mm-hmm. the temperature of it the slickness of it and all that kind of stuff the more people can build up all these impressions in their own internal rolodex the easier it is for them to describe targets uh, as it comes in as a remote viewer I see what you mean. Yeah, it's about having that well of experience to to, to use as a raw material to sort of explain. Yes, that's yes. fair. Yeah, that makes sense. I yeah, um, the oh, process can only use what you've learned yourself to, to interpret the signal that's, that's that's coming in. I see. Yeah, is it? Um, I mean, I, can, I have so many more questions. Uh, <laughs> what okay. if you? Well, one question that came from an audience member that I thought was really good is if you had to. Um, Pick one case that you could say, like, this is how I can prove to you that this stuff works. Here's a case example. What would be the best case example you could use as a reference point for someone who doesn't know much about this subject? Yeah, a best case. I don't think any one case that I've done would persuade anyone. Um, oh, yeah, I don't know. I would, I would, I would have to turn that on its head and do what they used to do at SRI when they used to have, like the generals and people come in and say, "Oh, this is hogwash. This doesn't work." They used to sit that person down, um, and make them do a remote viewing session on the spot. And ninety percent of the time, that person would do so well that it would it would scare the hell out of them and shock them, and they would never come back again to to question the remote viewing. You're talking about the person actually questioning it. Yes, saying that, that it's bullshit. That, yes, that's the they best make thing. That person do a session. They made that person do it. Yeah. And what we find there's a phenomenon within remote viewing and all psychic stuff, but mainly remote viewing, in that uh, we call it the first time effect. In that when someone does remote viewing or something psychic like this uh, for the very first time, they usually get an above av- average uh, accuracy, really good, because. Their their system's not ready for it, so you, it can't counter it, and it just it just yeah it just bypasses all their normal defensive kind of hindrances, and they yeah and it just blows them out of the way. So that's what they did at SRI. They found that that they couldn't persuade people otherwise because they kept coming back with, well, maybe you had a microphone in the room somewhere, or maybe mm-hmm. the person knew it before in advance. So what they ended up doing is sitting the person down and saying, okay, here's a number. Just write what impressions you got in your head for the next couple of minutes on a sheet of paper, and then we'll mark it against the target. And that always that always works. That's what I would do with anyone that wanted to know. I don't think me showing my examples would ever persuade anyone that had a, a very skeptical mi- mindset on them. If I'm honest with you, um, I- I'll ask you about a specific case that I heard about uh, just when I was researching for this show. Uh, is is it true that Ingo Swan, I believe, was able to Shut down a quark detector. At it was, SR. It was a magneto- magnetometer. Yes, magnetometer. So, so that in in that case, that would be something that kind of would would wow a materialist. They could look at that and go, "Wow, there's real data here that we can." Yes, but even the people, even the people that have looked at that over the years, are kind of gone. Are you sure he didn't know? You know, was the machine working in the first place? Do you know what I mean? There's so many variables you can ask yourself about that. But you know, he, yes, he did do that. He was taken into a building. It was his first test at SRI. Uh, scientific building and the, and the magnetometer was I think something like 20 feet embedded in concrete below the building and he was just asked on the spot to uh, remote view the magnetometer and it was outputting at the time on, on you know with one of those pens on a sheet of paper uh, and as, as he tried to look inside it uh, which he did do because he actually managed to accurately sketch how it worked as well its mechanisms which was you know a top secret at the time hmm. um, but as he was doing it the pen stopped on on the sheet of paper for its first time as well um, that's spooky yeah and you know you, you can you can online actually see the uh, i've got copies of it, the, the sheet of paper with it with it stopping and stuff so he wow. he did manage in some way to perturb it or 
he could have just stopped the pen. If you know, we don't know where this. Do you know what I mean? We we don't know what lies there. He could have actually stopped the machine, or he could have stopped the pen recording what the machine did. So, but mm. either way, something strange. But uh, I imagine at that point they would have like. All hands on deck. Let's get 10 more people in here and look at this. Can we do this 150 more uh, times? Apparently like- one of the scientists panicked so much, he tried to run out of the room and, and turn around and, ner- and walked into a pillar and nearly knocked himself out and stuff. Wow. And they had to dismantle the machine uh, because, you know, this is this is a precision piece of engineering under, all, under a, a feet of concrete that wasn't meant to be affected in any way. So actually doing that experiment caused quite a lot of uh, problems. That's fascinating. I, 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 I want to ask a few more rapid fire questions if I can, just that people were very curious about. And then I want to change gears a little bit and move on to UFOs if we could. Yeah. Um, Can you read numbers and can you read specific characters off of sheets of paper or of computer or something like that? You can. They are for the majority of us. So slightly uh, more complex. Um, uh, Yeah. and there's various reasons behind this. Uh, if the if the number meant nothing to me, for example, and is you know someone just said here's an eight digit number, can you read it? Um, I can try, but it's very hard. In the, everything we do with remote viewing is all about uh, describing targets. So we, as, as I said earlier, we try not to name targets. Hmm. We try to dis- describe targets with as much low level data as possible to stop our imagination. So you know, if, for example, if the if the target were a, a, a car, for example. I'd be describing it like it feels hard, it feels solid, uh, the temperature's cold, it feels curved, it's smooth to the touch, it feels like it's moving, you know, it feels like it might have four spherical, round, uh, bouncy, black, rubber-like components to it. You know, so we're trying to describe it in as much detail as possible uh, using, you know, our senses of uh, taste, touch, smell, and texture, and all that kind of stuff. If I said to you right now, using those kind of things to, right now, describe a number three to me using your senses. Mm. It has none. We, it has a visual shape and a form, but it has no, it has no texture, it has no temperature, it has no smell, it has no you know it has no color it has no it has no taste how do you how do you describe a and all really number all numbers are are uh, concepts for groups of objects but it would seem like if you can sketch if sketching is such a key part of it you could sketch the numbers right like if you just got an impression you, of a four you, you would can just... but sketches aren't perfect representations of targets so for example if i sketch and i do a couple of curves like that and it made it like a three, but it also made it like half of an eight that I just haven't managed to get the other half of the eight in. I see. Or if I do a one with a curl like that, and it looks like a six, because there's no orientation in space on the paper, is it a six or is it a nine upside down? Does it make a difference if the number that you're looking at or the, or the information you're trying to, I think you mentioned this earlier, exists now or will exist in the future? Uh, that might uh, uh, that would probably need more work, but that might that might be a problem in it as well, as well as I imagine. Like um, uh, to be more specific, like when you do financial type forecasting, I, I yeah. imagine that's a lot more dependent on actual numbers and, and data than no, say we're getting in future forecasting. We're, and I can show you some examples of this. Uh, we're getting very good results at forecasting, but we're not looking at numbers. Uh, uh, we're trying to draw the, um, we're getting very good correlation in drawing the market flows of how the market See. peaks go up and down uh, to a to a very accurate degree on those. So you can like, you can sort of predict a, a, a larger trend, but getting a yes. specific stock that's going to be yeah, the for one. For example, if I'm looking at how, uh, how gold's going to work over the next thirty days, I can I can quickly go. Oh, I think it's going to go like like this. This is, you know, it starts off here at this point. Right. It's going to go up, and, and you know we can do it over a graph over a period of days. So the graph actually shows thirty days, and we can go like this. One I of my see. colleagues, Naeem, uh, has been charting Bitcoin, uh, and he does thirty days each month. He just does little arrow. He's going to go up today, down to, or sideways, and so on. He's over eighty three percent accurate over something like twelve months now of charting Bitcoin predictions day on day. Did he get out before the collapse? When the, <laughs> the big one happened. Yeah, it's not, it's doing all right at the moment. Yeah, doing all right at the moment. Yeah, okay. we're all doing all right with our crypto investments. So there are ways around it um, sure. where you, you don't go for numbers themselves. As I said, because uh, you can try to draw numbers, um, 
Uh, and we're, we also, in, in future forecasting, we're, we are getting to be quite good. Again, it's taken us years to get there uh, at letters and stuff as well. Um, like, for example, when we're looking at cryptos, we always try to, to because uh, we're doing it blind. We do, we do know in those cases we're looking at a crypto. So someone says to us, okay, we, we want you to tell us about a crypto for, for the next target. And it's at the moment, it's like one, one in 40,000 because there's 40,000 cryptos out there. So, you know, we, we know it's crypto, but we don't, you know, it's not very specific. Mm. So to try to hone in and be specific, one of the crypt criteria we try to do is as a group, we all try to, to describe and draw the logo or branding. And if we get that right, it kind of gives an indicator that we're on target for that crypto. I see. Um, and we yeah. are getting very good at describing and drawing uh, logos and brands. And, and the majority of logos and brands are made up of, of usually of words or letters. Mm. So we are getting there slowly with getting accuracy on letters. Um, but there's the, also the, another hindrance in that all of, you know, there are some amazingly talented psychics and remote viewers out there for the last 50 years. And not one of them has managed to win millions on the lottery. Um, and we find as well that on smaller amounts, like I can win, you know, I've and I've won loads of small bets on horses and races and games and outcomes like that and stuff when it's a small amount of money. But the moment we all try to go for things which is massively life changing on big levels, you know, hundred, we're talking, you know, like a hundred million on euro millions here for me in the UK. It just doesn't work. It just does not happen. Um, and I personally uh, have come to the the realization that there's probably something more in play, mm. um, maybe something universal out there that that's not part of why I'm here. Uh, and, and I say, and I use this example because I'm honest with people. Uh, I know that I truly believe that, you know, from an early age, I knew that remote viewing was my calling and this is what I was meant to be doing all my life. But I also know that if I won a hundred million tomorrow on the lottery, I would never do remote viewing ever again. I'd be on an island somewhere <laughs> drinking tequila for the rest of my life. Sure. And maybe that's just, you know, maybe there is a force or something out there and that's just not in my destiny for me to win the hundred million. And that there is something out there that's uh, not allowing me to do so. That's really interesting because it's like, it, it clearly produces information that people find very valuable and useful i imagine because people get paid to do it so clearly there's a there there but uh and as i i'm sure at a certain level people are able to make tremendous money off of this information yeah yeah and i'm you know i am i'm not rich by any means um but, but you know i'm part of future forecasting group and we do look at cryptos and stuff and over the last four years i've uh, I, my disposable income that i've managed to invest uh, using intuition uh i've increased its value by 500 percent Wow. I think there was a, uh, if I remember right, and I could be, if you, if I'm wrong on this, check me, but uh, a story about how Putoff was able to yeah. kind of uh, reproduce these results. He was able to, I don't on know. On the silver's was, market. Yeah. Is that what it was, silver? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think they made, uh, they went from a few thousand dollars to something like 123,000 or something in, in, in like a week or two. And then, and then when they tried it again on a second attempt to make it even more, it completely fell. Do you think that uh, you mentioned before, sometimes logos are easier. Uh, is that because the idea of a brand uh, is sort of a meta concept that's built up around the logo? And so there's a bigger mental and it has a bigger footprint in the mental environment or where the information that, environment does that. that make is a, yeah, that might be a possibility. Uh, and it might also be that may uh, again, it, all this needs more research that mm. it's not being done. Um, some of our greatest hits of, of, getting the cryptos and their logos might be on the ones that more people are invested in. So there's more of a consciousness kind of footprint behind it for us to go into. Again, we don't, we don't know because no one's doing hardcore science research on this since it all stopped in, in 95. It's just people like myself and others using it and, and trying to discover new things on, on what I would call an amateur scientist basis. So would, is it, if I'm understanding this correctly and the, the, the picture that you've, painted so far is that uh, for a period of 20 years, the government invested real money and real reputable yes. experts, including Hal Putoff, Russell Targ, and others, put many others, many yes. others yes. developed a formal structured system. Yes. And that is a, ha, produces reproducible uh, results. 
Yes. And that has been refined now by a generation of remote viewers who have come out of that program and then taught others and, and taught others. Yes. And so now it's in out the public, in the wild. In the public domain, it's a lot more refined now. And you know, people like myself and other groups out there are using it on outcomes, predictions, sporting, bets, using it to, you know, as I said, I'm my my personal investment is at 500%. You can't get that from a bank. <laughs> That's true. That's a great point. Um, yeah. Can, do, do uh, is there a way to use uh, either substances like um, uh, drugs or other substances to increase accuracy or, or ver- change results? Or is there technology that can be used? Like I, one example someone threw at me that I thought was really interesting is if you were sitting in a uh, sensory deprivation tank or a Faraday yeah. cage, has that been studied before? Yeah, Far- uh, Faraday cages have been studied, um, and it, can, it goes uh, to, to what I said earlier. You know, they did all the research on that, and they found that there are no hindrances to remote viewing. Um, it, it didn't matter if a person was in a Faraday cage, uh, and they used a natural Faraday cage in that um, they sent some psychics uh, down in a submarine several miles down under the sea, which is a natural Faraday cage, you know, because it hinders all signals coming out from it. And the uh, psychics on land, including Ingo Swan and several others, were able to receive messages psychically from the submarine, which was, you know, far under the water. So that proved to them that, you know, it wasn't some kind of real physical, almost like mental telepathy kind of radio signal thing going going on in any way. They, they so- found that there's... Yeah, distance time shielding does not hinder remote viewing can, in, can in any two way. Can people communicate? Can information go both ways? Yes. And is that is that different than remote viewing? Does that just become telepathy at that point? Or are we talking well, about the same thing? This is where it gets a bit muddy in that are, are there in any limitation? As, as humans, we like to try to do things in black and white. You say yeah. you know, it's like good or bad, evil, black and white. Nothing's like that. It's like a it's like a scale. Um, is it remote viewing or telepathy? Um, I think it's probably both at the same time, but we don't know where one begins and another ends because everything in the universe. If we follow the rules of quantum physics and entanglement, everything in the universe is already entangled. So you know, me mm. and you are connected. You know, that's why I don't see no sense in people killing each other because you're just killing a part of yourself in essentially. So you know, yeah. I think uh, telepathy or, or is it remote viewing or it's like, uh, there, there are no, there are no boundaries. But I think been, some, has it been done to your knowledge where information can be transmitted accurately from person to person regardless? Yes. That's, well, that's the been sub, done. The sub one was a great example because uh, they sent a message that, which was interpreted, interpreted whether the sub should rise or, or, if, you know, if it go to the service or if it should stay uh, under and that was transmitted psychically. Wow, yeah, that's fascinating. I um and and other people have done you know many other experiments uh, along those lines as well. I think the moment, I think it works like this because we create our own realities with this. It's very, it's a very um, malleable subject and thing. What we're talking about. I think the moment you actually start saying to yourself, "Okay, let's let's make this more of a telepathy experiment than a remote viewing experiment," it automatically almost like morphs and shifts for telepathy to be more usable within the experiment whereas yeah. and if you're saying okay it's it, it there's no telepathy involved in this next one it's just pure remote viewing for getting information which is passively about a target i think then the process may be just changes and allows you to do that passive instead of aggressive i think uh, i think i would class the telepathy as aggressive in that both of you are receiving or or uh, we don't know if there's any receiving or sending but both of you have connected in a way to transfer information i think when i when i'm sent to look at a target and the majority of the ones i'm sent to look at are usually uh present time or past Mm. uh i think that's what i would class as passive information transfer the information's already happened it's out there somewhere in time and space or everywhere in time and space and i'm just popping in and getting it and then getting back out kind, kind of thing so i think that's more passive than the uh telepathy but as i said it's all very malleable i think sometimes when i'm doing remote viewing especially when it's a non-human intelligence related there's a possibility that not only am i remote viewing but then part of me might shift into a telepathy thing then Mm. shift back into remote viewing maybe shift into something else you know so we're using multiple modes of data gathering and that's why i said i think uh remote viewing is 
we we perceive and retrieve what I call multi-form information. So it's different types of information on many different levels. Is this uh, something that everyone has the ability to do and some people are just better at it than others? Or is this yeah. like only certain people can do it? Absolutely. Everyone has the ability you know, intuitive ability to to some degree or another. You know, we uh, some of us are just you know naturally more advanced. That it's like everything in life, isn't it? You know, mm. uh, we can all probably if you put a piano in front of all of us, we could all probably make a noise. But some of us might intuitively or just because of skill or something be able to you know, knock out a proper tune. And with practice over mm. say six months practice with a mentor, they might be able to then you know play an actual song with no music there in front of them whatsoever. Whereas still some of us will be able to only just play chopsticks. So yeah, it's a natural ability, but for some of us, it can be helped as well by uh, practice and by, you know, just, you know, mental kind of uh, spending. A, it's like what they say with some disciplines in it uh, to become a master or something you need to spend. Is it 10,000 hours or yeah, something? 10, 000, practice, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, once you've done that, I think I think that massively helps. Yeah. And it's like you said earlier about uh, the people who would come in doubting if it was possible, and then you can get them to get a really great result. Yes. Is that kind of like uh, they're just relaxed, they're not thinking about it? In other words, if they overthink it, it clams them up in a yeah. way that... that's why the first time usually happens so well in that their system gets, get, gets tricked. Right. And I it's see. a complete shot to them. And they're like, oh, holy shit, this actually works. And then the next time they try it, if you sit them down five minutes there and try it again... Their system's in such shock that they, they usually just bomb and just can't do the target whatsoever because you can't trick it a second time. You need, you need time then for uh, your internal mechanisms and systems uh, over a period of weeks and months to, to adjust to the new levels. Because, you know, it, it's when you have this kind of experience where you realize, you know, or part of you realizes that there are no boundaries, you can actually go anywhere in time and space. That is a massive epoch mind bodily shift system to think about and, and to try to interpret in in your entire you know being of life and where you are in the in the universe can you talk honest, about, uh, can some you... people can't cope with it and you know i have seen people and there are recorded cases you know even in the when the military did it and stuff of a couple of people having breakdowns because of this can you talk a little bit more uh before we move on about that because i think that's an interesting point it's 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 one thing i think for a person to Put on some music, get into a really relaxed state, lie back on a comfortable couch, and then let their mind wander. And you can do that and have very vivid imagination of being a play, in a place or having yeah. sensory information. What is it? How do you know internally when you're doing it? it are you able to tell that that you break from that and you're you're now remote viewing in a traditional real sense? Or is it more like you have to look at the data after the fact and then you, you have to look at the data after the fact over them. I would say, cause I've been doing it 27. I've been doing remote viewing on its own 27 years. I think over a very long period of time and lots and lots of experience, the key thing about remote viewing is I don't, and we don't learn anything new. Uh, uh, or I mean this in the way of techniques or enhancements. I think what we learn over that long period of time is about ourselves. So I've learned that these very subtle signals, and we're talking minutely subtle signals that come in, I've learned over 27 years to kind of trust in them and kind of know, and I, I can't describe how, I just know that, you know, if I feel that the target's hard and it's made of stone, I know that that's, that's right, but that's based on 27 years of doing this over and over and over again right. to know what that vibration -y kind of feeling feel, feels like. It reminds me of, um, are you familiar with uh, the, the cases of people who, uh, who people who are blind who are able to use echolocation yeah. they teach themselves yes. how to click or they make a click yes. sound and they're able very to, much like that you're, you're almost yeah. like developing a part of your of your brain that can give you that yeah put words have you ever yeah. have you ever done martial arts <laughs> not very well but yeah okay well let's let's say for example i i have i'm i was very interested in martial arts in my life but let's say uh we take one like uh uh, let's say normal karate, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and you start off, you don't know how to throw a punch. So, you know, you start off and someone teaches you how to throw a punch. And you learn, you, know, you do a punch, you know, you, you mm -hmm. move out like that. 
and at first you don't really know what you're doing. It feels awkward. Your muscles aren't quite right. But if you do that 10,000 times, um, very shortly, you know, a hundred punches in, you've already started to get a bit of bodily kinesthetic muscle memory of how that punch should work. Someone comes along then they say, but if you also swivel your hips, put the hips into it, and then you start you learn to swivel your hips into it and trusting that process over the next couple of hundred, you could, can you see and understand how your punch then starts to develop a 10,000 in, Mm-hmm. You don't even have to think about the punch anymore like a boxer. It's just like, you know, you, you dodge, and then you yeah. before you're even dodging, your arm's already moving as muscle memory to respond to it. That's like remote viewing. Over mm-hmm. 10,000 of me doing 10,000 of these projects over and over and over, my whole body is kinesthetically muscle memory telling me, understanding what it is and the process. And that, that you know, it's the same for any kind of dancer, you know, any kind of sportsman or any kind of skill-based activity. It, it, it's muscle memory and practice over time that allows your body to be in touch with whatever it is you're doing. And it's the same for remote viewing. Anyone can do it, but the more time and effort and dedication you put into it, the more hmm. you know and understand your body, which means the more you can be accurate with the data that it, it comes out with. And eventually at a certain point, it's like blood sport where he's got the blindfold on and he just you know it yeah, literally is like, you, know, you get to a, yeah you get to a stage as a remote viewer where yeah. you don't care about if you're right or wrong anymore you just know it's just a process you totally trust in the information so you're not questioning anything mm. and that's when your accuracy and everything attains a level of, of being very good because you're not you're not you're in a process that you're like you're in the flow you're in the zone and you're not you're not hindering it in any way um, so yeah, it just seems, it just seems more accurate, but I can't say when you get to that area, it took me like five or six years, I think, to get to, to attain, to attain that state. Sure. Uh, no, that, that makes sense. I, that's a great way of explaining it actually, because I'm not, I, I, I'm fascinated by it and I'm, I'm learning more yeah. about it, but as you get into it more deeply, you start to realize just how deep the rabbit hole goes and there's so much more information. It's, it's hard without yes. a guide to really explore yeah. the subject. You don't know. Yeah. Yeah, as I said, we're we're like we're like sportsmen or athletes or something. You know, you need a, you, there's a natural ability mm. because they will have a natural ability as well. Um, and then it's it's many years of practice to build up a muscle memory, so your body knows how to work in certain situations, uh, and then you trust that uh, so that it just becomes free flowing. And it's exactly the same as yeah as doing a, a, a sport or a high level musical skill or something creative like that which is so that's the the value of the feedback that you get helps you refine that process without that feedback it does, you yes. couldn't really because what you know especially in your early days because you do your 20 or 10 or sheets of information then you get a feedback package and then you can go back for your remote viewing session and i i mentor this to students so i get them to go back for their remote viewing session and write a journal uh so they write notes so they they go back and say well on page one my sketch does actually look like this part of the mm. target there. And I even accurately just wrote. And the fact that they go back and review it and they write notes on it also reinforces that learning process is, is, is well for them. Yeah. So uh, feedback, feedback is key, especially in the very early days of learning to be a remote viewer and in training. And as you mentioned, it being uh, able to sort of tune into your own physicality and, and understand where the signals are coming from, then to go back to an earlier question, does a isolation tank help that process or have you ever looked at that? Like sitting in a sensory deprivation? Uh, I haven't looked at that. Some people have. And again, I think it's individualistic. Mm-hmm. Some people like that. Um, like we all have our different ways of getting in the zone. Some people, you know, for example, I listen to um, just classical music because I, I don't like to hear, have any words in my music because I find that the words might, Mm. prompt me to think of stuff i don't want to think about so i always listen to classical type music or soundtracks without words but you know i know of some remote viewers that listen to heavy rock because that's what makes them relax before they before they do rv um is this or is is there any overlap between what robert monroe did with the gateway process yeah. and hemisync and remote viewing yeah, they, uh, they you know a lot of the remote viewers from the military did actually go to uh, Hemi and learn HemiSync uh, and the gateway process at the Monroe Labs, um, and there is good evidence that you know some of the HemiSync does work by getting you in a slightly altered state of consciousness. Um, 
I don't I don't use any of that kind of stuff, but there are there are remote viewers out there that do. Again, it's 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 horses for courses is whatever sure. work, w- works for you. You know, you have to find your own your own uh, ritualistic kind of process. And you know, as I said, I just sit down here at a table with my tablet and pen, mm-hmm. and I always have a cup of cup of coffee. Uh, I don't need the cup of coffee. It's become a ritual to make myself a cup of coffee sure. to to sit down and say, okay, it's work time, kind of kind of thing so that's my ritual is i have a cup of coffee and i always i always always play 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 um music um i don't think i've ever done an rv session without music um again i don't need it it's just a just something i've added is as as a personal ritual it's not needed but it's needed for me it's interesting uh how many artistic people uh yeah, uh, sort of coalesce around the world of UFOs and consciousness research and 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 this yeah. type of study. Do you find that there is an? Oh, are they more represented, or is that just because there's definitely you know, a variety um, of people involved? Uh, and I think that uh, personally, I think the more creative you are, or if you have a creative uh, bent or skill in some way, then that I think uh, we don't know why, but I think that helps in in you expressing remote viewing. Um, it's like what I said, you know, with the martial arts and the, and the music and stuff. I, uh, I think that creative inspiration hmm. probably, you know, because we don't know where ideas and creativity comes from. I think it actually comes from the same uh, consciousness or entangled universe of information where, where remote viewing data comes from. I think when I'm being creative and coming up with a logo for a client, because and I have to get into their mind to get to see what they want for me to put down on paper. I think that's almost exactly the same as when I'm doing a target for a tasker and I'm going to a target, to get the information that they want. So I think it's the, the same thing, but with a slight different twist on it. I, uh, I just have to ask the last question before we move on because, uh, you're a photographer and I am as well. And I know, noticed that, uh, in your work, you are a great street photographer. And I know that with street photographer, I, I, I'm not as good as you, but I, I know that when you're doing it, there is a zone that you get into and it's very yeah. reactive and instantaneous. And there's almost like you can see the picture before it happens. And there's sort of yeah. a, do you find uh, that that connection is, is very visceral for you between what your remote viewing work is and, yeah. and the way that you sort of see visually? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm all, I'm almost in the same kind of flow state when mm-hmm. I'm doing that and to do, and how I do it for myself when I'm doing the photography is, uh, I always take out five or six um, photography-based podcasts. Mm. So I'm listening to people talk about street photography or, or photography as I'm walking the streets, and that keeps my mind focused on on that and not wandering, thinking, you know, oh, what should I cook for tea when I get home later kind of, right. kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm in the zone with that, and then I'm always looking around as well. And if I see something, I think to myself, okay, it's not quite right now, but in, in five, 10, mm-hmm. 15, 20 minutes, the right person may walk along in the right place. So, and I'm, I'm like a fisher. I will fisherman. I will s- stay there because it's like hunting and fishing. Sure. Sometimes I hunt and sometimes I, I fish. I see a, sometimes I see a thing and think I just got to stay here until the light's right or yeah. the person. Right. And sometimes I'll, I'll be there for, for an hour waiting. That's interesting. I, I, um, uh, often think about it like, it's almost like in the matrix, like bullet time. Like sometimes you could, you have to be yeah. so present in the moment and so many things are happening around you. And it's almost yes. like you have to be completely in tune with it or yeah. you'll miss it. And and you can see the picture before it happens. And then there's like yeah. this moment where you get it. Yeah. And if you get it, it's just immediate feedback. You're like, yes. Yeah. And although I use, uh, I think you use a Fuji like I do uh, mm-hmm. and everything on my Fuji, I've set up for it to actually show me in black and white on the camera when I'm actually out photographing as well. Uh, you know, so I, I put the podcast on and I'm walking along. Everything that I'm thinking photography wise about the environment around me as I'm looking around for images, that's in my mind's eye is already in black and white. That's interesting. As well. That's really interesting. So you're seeing it. You're almost I'm filtering seeing it, it in through. my head in like remote viewing, but in black and white hmm. before. Yeah, before I'm before I'm seeing the image a fraction of a second before I'm seeing the image. That's really interesting. I wonder, because I think about a lot of different artistic people that have been involved in UF, like Bud Hopkins was a painter, Ingo Swam was a painter, you're a photographer, yep. uh, you know, just different people uh, who have a very, even um, John Mack was a writer and an author. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Most of the remote viewers I know have 
some kind of uh, creative thing going on, whether it be music or painting or, or something. Yeah. Um, I have to do a hard shift into UFOs because we've gone uh, a little bit over our time. <laughs> I wanted to move on to the next phase of this thing. Yep. The, the, the UFO community and the remote viewing community seem to have a lot of overlap. And I was wondering if you could talk yeah. a little bit about uh, what, what do you know about the relationship between those two worlds? How do they relate to one another? And what can remote viewing okay. tell us about um, what's going on? It certainly seems like things have yeah. picked up steam lately. Do you um, yeah. have any insights yeah. there? Yeah, well, well, the connections. Um, the connections are very deep um, and even more deeper than a lot of people would probably realize. I think there's some stuff coming out now to to show how deep it goes. And in fact, I was talking to someone, underground guy last night. Did you ever read um, the Fred's document that was out a couple of, about 18 months ago? No, uh, no, I don't think so. Like really. a, a mega point and someone else um, that detailed it a little bit. Um, but yeah, just for, uh, yeah, uh, as an overview. If you can send me that, I'll link to, if, can I link to this in the show notes? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's okay. available on, online. Um, essentially, I mean, remote viewing and UFOs have been inexplicably linked since since it started. And the moment people started looking, you're looking at targets using remote viewing, they started reporting um, uh, seeing and having interactions with non-human entities. I mean, it's always happened before. You know, if you look back through classical psychic stuff and channeling, going back, you know, the last, say, even if you just look back the last two hundred years, mm -hmm. you can see huge amounts of accounts of it, uh, of it in that. Um, it's just that now with remote viewing and the uh, and the protocols and the practices of having feedback, it's a lot easier to quantify, you know, the information on if if that kind of thing happened. So yeah, the uh, the links are are massive, huge, in depth, and a lot more in depth than people don't realize. Um, and you know, we have key people like, for example, uh, Harry Putoff, who essentially created remote viewing and kept it running for twenty three years for the for uh, various branches of the American government. He's now at the core of uh, the TTA disclosure movement with, with the whistleblowers and everything else going on right now as well. I think that's the most, this is the most fascinating thing for me. And I, I think this is one of the reasons why I was so excited to get a chance to talk to you and pick your brain, because I, this connection, as far back as I can see, um, the, the consciousness UFO connection is very clear. And you yeah. can go back to like Aleister Crowley, his drawing yeah. of lamb, which it looks basically like a gray. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think most people would agree, at least strongly looks that way. And uh, the work of Jacques Vallée, if you go back far enough, th there's yeah. this historical sort of relationship between the mental realm, these beings yeah. that seem to be very comfortable with it and interacting with it, and then yeah. us. And we seem to be very, like, clunky and almost like yeah. we're always playing catch up with this thing. Yeah, that might be for a reason, though. Um, there are some remote viewers uh that have indicated that there are mechanisms in play by some of these non humans to um what's the right word to hinder uh human psychic ability because uh because it's for their benefit to hinder us being able to do the things that we can do mm. so that's why it might be kind of clunky is because uh there are physical and mental mechanisms to stop us doing that. And even Ingo Swan, well, I mean, Ingo Swan reported that kind of stuff, for example. Pat Price, who was another great psychic, he reported that, uh, that uh, there are physical places on the planet that kind of do something to stop people being more psychic than we actually are. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, once we are, then we become a bit more of a threat to some of these non-humans that are doing, you know, doing their their things with us and stuff. I, I yeah, I want to drill into this, and I have some specific questions about uh, 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 this in more detail. I, I'm curious before we go there, though. Uh, do you think that the consciousness connection here, and I don't know, I don't really have the, I, I'm not sure if that's the best term to use, but does consciousness represent a branch on the technology tree that we have maybe ignored up until now, and that another? intelligence may be found and was able to develop the same way that we developed like artificial intelligence or nuclear technology. That, um, do you know that's what I'm, a good question? Um, 
uh, I think, well, I know, I know that uh, very early on in, in this, in at least the sixties, various um, corporations like McDonnell Douglas, and I, you know, there, there are documents on my RV website, McDonnell Douglas, when they were investigating some of the UFO crashes and UFO incidents, they knew back in the sixties and seventies that the, the biggest proponent to conquering the UFO solution was uh, human psychics and human consciousness. Um, so I think there are organizations out there that, that did know the connection, but that mainstream ufologists and UFO people were worried about making that connection. And it's only the last couple of years that they've started to look at there being a consciousness and, and remote viewing connection to, to UAPs. Uh, which to their detriment is, is mean that they're far behind in this. Uh, and, you know, I, I, it's my opinion that consciousness research and remote viewing could be the keys to unlock everything to do with what's happening with the non-human intelligence situation. From what uh, I've seen, you know, the things I've experienced, um, for example, some of the targets I've worked and, you know, I have worked some targets for people involved in the disclosure stuff and i can even show you some right now if you want if you want to have a look at some sure um if you've got you know, if you I've have something did, ready sure yeah i can show you somewhere which i didn't like you know and for example i've been tasked to look at you know non-humans and you know when i was looking looking at some of the non-humans and even going down to the level of looking at the clothing that they were wearing and describing the this kind of like uh fibrous clothing that was like two microns thick that even the even the clothing uh, had an AI like symbiotic consciousness relationship with the with the person that it was cover well not the person the life form that it was covering. So not only are the the life forms kind of conscious that have a consciousness like like we do, but the, the actual physical outfit it was wearing this this literally two micron thick sheer silver suit was actually conscious and connected symbiotically to the life form. And that and the life form were also symbiotically connected consciously to the craft, which mm -hmm. also had its own consciousness. So everything they're using, although we don't, you know, like we don't recognize like this microphone and my water, you know, my water cup here, we don't recognize in normal space that this, this cup having a consciousness, mm -hmm. but the objects and things that these life forms are using some of the some of their technology, which is just normal day to day technology, has a has a, like an AI type symbiotic consciousness relationship with with its host. It's very strange. I think that's the most probably the most interesting aspect of all of this is because we know that there is a nuts and bolts component, but it yeah. seems like there's this entire other layer that ties directly to consciousness, and it's very hard for our science to explain that or get a get its arms around yeah. it. So we're we're left sort of reaching for, you know grasping at straws to try and figure out how to connect these two things but i mean i've heard Absolutely. uh yeah. i've heard it described that only somebody with telepathic ability can fly one of these crap but if you have that person yeah. they can actually and i've also heard and i don't know some of this maybe just uh hearsay but i've heard and this rings true that when a pilot is operating one of the craft, they almost become the craft. They merge with it and yes. it becomes an extension of them. That's that's my experience from remote viewing it. Yes, like like the craft is a consciousness amplifier in a sense. Uh, yes, it's like a yeah, and it's like a, it, everything works symbiotically. So uh, there is you know once the uh, the pilot uh, and not just the craft, but other stuff around them, you know, as I said, like the suits and all kinds of stuff, it, they, it all works in concert together, a bit like uh, all the different um, instruments playing a piece of music, mm -hmm. all work and enhance to, together to create a certain kind of vibrational frequency that, that, that works, that they can, you know, you can all hear each other's notes and how you fit in kind of, yeah, so it all, uh, I'm, I find it very hard to describe, but it's, it all creates a symbiotic relationship of all everything working together, uh, but with with a consciousness. I'm not sure if it's all uh, what's the kind of word here? Not human consciousness. Um, I don't know. The consciousnesses are that I've experienced because you know I've looked at many of these targets. Some of them, like the the one, for example, when I was looking at or feeling the suit consciousness that had a consciousness feeling about it, but it wasn't as in depth 
and it yeah of the same flavor as as a it's it, of like as like a human or as like a living thing kind of consciousness it's almost a bit more like what we're what we're finding now with our technologies of looking at ais it's a bit more of an artificial consciousness i would say that that's probably the wording for it yeah so that's I think interesting because that, it, it suggests that there, there's like maybe biological consciousness that arises from a biological organism and consciousness that is not necessarily biological, but yes. no less. I think I think I think there's many different levels that we don't really understand. Some natural, um, and I think they have the ability to create artificial consciousnesses like like AIs, but you know, without having the massive supercomputers to 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 run the AI. I think the uh, the computative power of of these artificial consciousnesses are actually embedded in the structure of the universe itself at a micron level. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to understand it, but yeah. Yeah, that's there the, is like, the limitations of our language and vocabulary are pretty... It is, and even more yeah. as, a, as a remote viewer, because I'm there looking at it and seeing it, and I'm thinking, oh, how do I put this into... How do I put these feelings into words? Sure, sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. I, I, yeah. um, I could see the challenge there. Yeah. Can you talk? But, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, if this is going uh, as a video, uh, is this going out as a video or an audio? Uh, video, a video, uh, but audio for some people, but mostly. But would you like me to show you some, for example? Yes, sure. So I can share a screen here, can't I? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to share a screen here for a second. Uh, let me see if I can pull this up. Window, entire screen. Let me try to make this big. Excellent. So I'm just going to get rid of it. So this is a, uh, this is a, I'm not going to say who the client is, but this is for a client um, to look at a future event that they might be involved in, uh, which turned out to be UAP related. Um, and it's just so you get the, uh, can I move this window here? Yeah, I can. So you can get an idea of some of the information a uh, remote viewer gets. So this is all the admin stuff at the top, you know, to so mm -hmm. that we know the structure of how I did the remote viewing. So I did this on, uh, 9th of February 2019 at 1.20 in the afternoon. I used CRV as a method. I was blind and I was alone when I did this. And all I had was that target number there. Uh, but because it's such a long number, I abbreviated it to 791 mm. as my focus number because I can't be, I'm lazy. I can't be bothered to write that long number. So, you know, I used the 791 as my launch pad here. And this is how I start getting information. So, I knew it was a structure here, multi-layer, compact, made of hard grays. And you can see it's all, I'm trying to describe it in as low-level data as possible without saying what it actually is. So it's angular, irregular, complex-shaped, angled, and manipulated, and so on. Then I start getting more information here. So then I decide to have a look at, you know, what, it, I got a shape here, egg shape. So I was thinking to myself, okay, let's do a cross-section. What does it look like if I cross-section it? So here's my cross-section shape of the different layers to this material which it feels like it's ceramic looking at a structure here again i knew that it's moving and it's transitory and i underline when every time i get a word i know is important i underline it so i knew that the word transitory is very important here and it had a, it, this this structure had motion and movement and it was dimensional and i wrote here it feels like an inorganic material that changes form and possibly even shape a material that bends reforms when a certain energy is applied and it feels a bit like Play-Doh in the fact that it can, you know, you can change its shape. So then I tried to look at it, and this is what I see in my vision of it changing shape and form. So it feels like a solid material is pulled from one place to another, seeking to malform a former structure that is in two places at the same time, but is also in the gap in between these two points. And it kind of has a feeling like it's molten kind of solder in the, in the way it moves. Here's some, just some dimensional information here. Here's me now going into some sketches. So this is the object. It vibrates, hums, and then shifts. It's dense but moving, semi-solid. Feels like it's ready to transform. When it transforms, it kind of like moves to a space, and then the rest of it gets pulled behind it. So it almost like banks in, in the place, and it becomes semi-liquid. Uh, I think this is me just looking at the the shape of it again. Slick curve, solid, dense, and it's vibrating. This feels like it's the hull. It's white, iridescent, curved, and it's a structure. Just going to more data here. 
It feels like the nose cone of an aircraft. It feels, you know, I'm getting an AOL. This is what I said. My mind's then jumping to saying, oh, if it feels like an aircraft, this has got to be an aircraft. So that's, that's like analytical. That's a guess. That's why that's marked off to one side. I'll just try to get some more shapes here. So here's the shape I was looking at. Then it looked like a tic tac type shape, uh, vibrating from the inside out. Uh, here I'm trying to describe the movement mechanism inside of it, how it moves um, through this kind of code. And again, I don't even know what I'm drawing at times, so I'm just trying to show you as best as possible. Here's me trying to say this is it, the object before. This is what it looks like during movement, and that's what it looks like after, where it kind of like pings into place. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know the object that I was looking at actually it almost like it melts. It has a dimensional shift or melt to it. Uh, here's me breaking down that word transitory to try to get more information out of it, and the word dimensional as well, and then vibration. So that was the end of the first one, but then I decided to have another go at it, um, and I tried to then look at the origin of the structure, of where it came from, and I knew it came from space. Uh, which was a way distant, and there was something about moons. It traveled over a long distance, but not over time. Um, and it went with, like three different processes. And I think each one of these is a stop point. And then I wrote here, feels like stops or navigation points of different sizes. Uh, it's all about exploratory stuff here. Um, I started to measure it. Oh, so that's what they were doing. Uh, I asked, what are they doing? And there's measurements and conditions of the planet. I sense a feeling of concern of being watched and measured, taking readings. Feels like they're looking for damage. They're observing, they're recording, and they're planning and it's experiments. Had a feeling of science and observation of records, making numbers, charts, tracking data, making readings, observations, and reactions. They're watching us like we observe life, uh, and it's almost like the feeling that they're they're looking at a zoo. Mm -hmm. Where where the zoo? A bit more there. Uh, I don't know what I'm looking at here. So oh, this is just the object in movement here. And I'm just trying to show where it's coming from here in, in space. Here's me looking at the side view of it again, of the materials. I wrote the materials as a prompt. Mm. And it's a composite, dense, compact, gray in layers, which are coated. Uh, very close, it looks like this, with all these layers, with energy that vibrates out for the layers. And then I kept seeing these weird, um, I don't know, how the energy works, kind of. Kind of uh, but I don't know anything about science, so I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is about how the vibration and the energy works through the craft itself, how it flows. The mechanism inside the craft that actually creates the energy that makes it flow, uh, I wrote here, feels like a central control holding a fizzling, dense, heavy thing. It fizzles when used, like it is evaporating or similar. This creates a strange effect, which is a bubble. And then I talk about non-physicals and what they're doing, uh, and symbiotic. Uh, symbiotic is a key word from this technology. The life, the energy, the movement, all symbiotically work uh, yeah, in, in integrated. It's not separate. Do you, uh, when you're cool. doing a session like this and you're starting to get this level of information, is there a natural point where you just like become weary and like run out of juice? Or do you know, can you keep doing this until you get enough information? You just usually about down? an hour at oh, no. a time and then you have a break and come back to it. And some of these on different days, like hmm. this is the next day that I've come back to it. Um, here I might be talking. Yeah, I'm looking at the energy in a bit more detail here, to, uh, and the uh, the life forms themselves. So I start get here getting an, an, an idea of uh, blue, gray, silver, pale, smooth skin, which is opaque, um, large cranium, dexterous fingers, long, thinner, and uh, no thumb, three or four fingers, and then I move on to sketches. So that's you know my sketch there. Then sketching the fingers as well with the little sucky pads on the fingers and stuff. Like an emaciated child I wrote here. That's what it looks like. Um, I'm just skipping through all this now. Uh, there's me looking inside the head at the brain. Oh. Side view, top view, cross section. What's this here I'm looking at? Um, this feels like a life, more energy than physical. Uh, life that shifts between uh, the two seamlessly, so it can be physical and non-physical. They can control dimensions. 
a life connected to everything more than us times times a thousand it's individual but also closely connected to a group a ho a source their mind is like a vast multifunctional organic computer multitasking on so many levels but it's also interacting with them feels so soft and benign uh, there's no feel or they, they didn't feel like they were, on to, were there to harm um but the experiment that they, they do experiments on us although there is a love for us uh, we are also seen as an animal like an in progress not understanding in full yet what's going on and they're collecting changing creating creating new life or a new species they said earth is like a garden uh we are like flowers and they're like the gardeners mm. mm-hmm. um so yeah that gives you a, a general you know that's just one rv thing there that i've done just giving you a general kind of overview of roughly the the, the kind of information we can get on, on a target so we, i imagine this is something you've looked at a number of times right you 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 seem pretty steeped in both worlds yes I, if yeah. i if i can just ask broadly uh, what is your thirty thousand foot view of what is actually going on are we dealing with like, what are we dealing with? What is the situation vis-a-vis non-human intelligence? And <laughs> like, that, that is a good question. Um, what can from you my experience, us? both in and out of remote viewing, because I did a lot of work on this before I got into remote viewing as well, and I wrote a book on it called Surfing the Psychic Internet. Um, everything you can imagine is going on, <laughs> okay. which doesn't help. So there are, there are what we cast as aliens, um, but there are also uh non just non-humans of many different levels of existence that we can and can't see or we can and can't feel um that are interacting you know with this earth and above this earth and everywhere else in the universe as well and that's why it's complicated Hmm. in that it's not just one thing it's you know it's like walking into the serengeti in africa and it's not just elephants it's it's all different types of things all trying to live harmoniously together but not harmoniously at the same time you know because some of them want to eat each other and stuff and some don't um and some live off each other and some don't some symbiotically live with each other and some don't some are nice and some are bad it's it's everything that you can imagine and it's going on um it's just that again as humans we don't we don't like to think like that we like to think of they're either aliens or they're not they're either yeah. good or they're bad they're they're good and bad and they're indifferent. Some of them are aliens. Some are interdimensional. Some are things that we don't even know how to class, like, you know, angelic beings, mm. demonic beings, you know, beings that have no form whatsoever, you know, m- maybe microscopic beings that we just can't see because we don't have the wavelengths. Mm. So it's it literally er- everything going on. But the bigger question is, I think, yeah, there are non-humans and interdimensionals that are interacting with us, but there are also, uh, aliens good and bad that are interacting with us some that want to help us and want us to become more in touch with the universe and in touch with what they're doing but there are some that seem to have a nefarious kind of part of what they're doing as well some of it it might just be that we just don't understand you know um they might be doing the same kind of things to us as we do as we do do our cows and our our dogs and cats and that and that kind of thing you know we treat yeah. them as being kind of nice to have around and kind of having a bit of a consciousness that we interact with, but they're not quite on the same level as us. Mm-hmm. So if we want to take them to the vet and get them chipped and stuff, we do it. And mm-hmm. I think that's how some of them that are, you know, looking down upon us, see us, but we don't, we don't, you know, we class ourselves as higher beings. So we don't like to, to think of it along those lines. That's the part that people would have a hard time with. Yeah. Is I, Yes. I think yes. that the, 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 for the average person, in particular, the people who have, come into the ufo conversation in the last say since 2017 as it's become more of a public uh, conversation yeah i think that the the broad understanding is like humans have been in charge of the planet this is our planet this is our home we've run the show we're the star of the movie and then yeah. recently this other thing is coming into our world and there's going to be a point where we it comes to a head and then there's like a contact and then it becomes star trek and we go from there yeah. And what you're suggesting, or the the picture, I, if I'm understanding correctly, that you're describing is more like we're waking up to the fact that we've actually been in the jungle the whole time. We just didn't yes. realize. It. And now it's yes. like, oh, we can see this jungle around us, but we don't know what's yes. in it. It's like we've been blind, and, or we've been wearing a, 
a blindfold and the blindfold's broken and we're like, whoa, we've got all this stuff around us. That's is really it good? Is it bad? How do we fit in with this? So how do you square what's been going on recently with David Grush and, and Lou Elizondo and To The Stars Academy? And we've had, you know, talk about craft and specifically of Ross Colthart saying that there's a craft someplace that is very obvious once you know where it is. And yeah. like, can remote viewing help us find some of this stuff? Is there any way that like, can we crowdsource absolutely. this investigation and get some answers? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and as I said, uh, I don't know if you've seen this stuff that we've been doing, but like on my Hellfire group, uh, I, I put out public projects on there. And for example, the public projects we've done so far uh, UAP related are we looked at uh, Frederick Venentich. He went missing from his plane in Australia in the seventies after seeing a UFO hovering above him. We looked at the Tic Tac UFOs, uh, the Roswell chips that Corso said he saw, Council Nine, uh, the Skinwalker Ranch and the Hitchhiker Effect, Bermuda Triangle, Havana Syndrome. We worked with Whitley Streber. Um, he asked us to look at one of his implants. We looked at that and the origin of that. Uh, the f- Philip experiment. Uh, we even looked at exoplanet Kepler 452b, which is meant to be something that might be habitable to see if we could see any life on that. And we, we found life and stuff. And the most recent one we did was uh, we uh, viewed a thing from the 70s called the, the Betts Sphere. It's mm. his family that found this metal sphere. We looked at that. Um, most of the remote viewers that looked at that found that it had some kind of very strange off-planet consciousness that was driving it and moving it in origin-wise. So we We've been putting out loads of projects. The only problem we have as remote viewers is that, you know, there's loads of stuff that I would personally love. You know, I've been looking at UFOs since 89. There's loads of stuff that I'd like to do, but because we have to work blind, I can't self-task myself to go look at these kind of things. Mm. I have to wait. So I had to literally wait 20 years for someone to get up the the, the numpty to task me to look at Roswell, for example, uh, and Area 51. I had to wait for someone to to task me it in a proper manner to, to have a look at that. I think um, uh, it, I wondered to what extent do remote viewers work with other researchers in the UFO community to sort of cross-reference different yep. data? As I as I said, I've done two projects now for uh, for members of the TTA group, mm-hmm. two paid-for projects. So they've paid me to look at stuff for them. Uh, I've been in dialogue with several other people in in the field uh, that are heavily involved what's the most surprising thing that you've personally learned about the phenomena oh that's a good one um i would say how long it's been going on uh and the fact that if anyone's an alien it's us um and how uh, integrated it is into every part of human existence and other, you know, the moon and, Mar- you know, for example, the moon and Mars are hugely important uh, assets to what's going on with this that, you know, you hear rumors about and people talk about, you know, the odd structure or the odd light, that kind of thing. But it, it, there, no one's actually gone in, into that, into the depth of re- like the remote viewers have. Mm. Uh, and I think they're they're massively important, or it will come out one day that they are massively important to what's happened to human existence. Yeah. Um, can you can you elaborate on that a little bit, or or would that be uh, opening a huge can of worms? There, there are a lot. There are past uh, and present structures on the Moon and Mars which are fully occupied. Um, uh, and that we probably came from one of those, probably Mars more than anything else at one point. And our, our past origins uh, are from other places in the universe where you know, we didn't originate here on, on Earth in this form. Kind of like a uh, Battlestar Galactica kind of a situation. There, yeah, there's indications um, that some of these beings uh, have been on a very long migration across the the universe uh, and we we are just a very small you know a very small part of that although we seen there seems to be something that some of them are very interested in and i truly believe it's probably our our abilities 
like we've been discussing tonight, to be able to do these remote viewing things that are, I think are being suppressed by them on many different mm-hmm. levels. Um, maybe even using physical devices, um, which is what some people seem to indicate, um, but definitely so sociologically and physiologically, you know, over the decades. Um, yeah, so there's there's all kinds of things going on, but yeah, the you know, the Mars and Moon are very important. And for example, anyone that's ever looked into Ingo Swan, the person that created remote viewing, uh, he did several experiments where he was tasked in 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 one case or a couple of cases by some very shadowy secret agents working for the American government to look at stuff on the Moon, and he detailed in that way he encountered beings that were working there that uh, had two different types of psychics working they had an offensive set of psychics and a defensive set of psychics and the defensive ones were stop people looking at certain things on the moon that they were doing but no one's ever asked the question of what are the offensive ones what were they doing or what yeah. are they doing that sounds so there's, totally there's lots to this that we just do not know it sounds totally badass that that's a thing i have to just say like the <laughs> first of all that just sounds amazing uh, but it also sounds uh, very frightening and, and alarming. It's very, yeah, it's very frightening because um, he was cast as one of the best remote viewers and psychics ever. You know, he's got a, you know, he did a million trials under scientific protocols. You know, everyone, you know, you can check his uh, credentials, his books and everything. Is this the case, by the way, though, that he was spotted? They they spotted him and sent him yes, away? Yes, he got kicked off the moon at one point, but he went back. Uh, he went back several times. Um, in fact, uh, I, I wrote about it quite a lot. In uh, I, I, I published a magazine called Eight Martinis, a remote viewer magazine. I've seen it, yeah. And um, people can download that for free. A couple of issues ago, for the very first time, I published one of Ingo's return visits to the moon to see what he could pick up. And he talks about their their library on there and how he interacted with these these beings and all kinds of stuff. Um, it's very interesting what they they did, but yeah, they essentially at one point kicked him kicked him psychically off. But in his archives as well, you know, because I've seen his archives mm-hmm. going on for the next uh, twenty thirty years of his life. From that point onwards, he did struggle with what seems like an ongoing uh, program of them keeping an eye on what he was doing regularly, maybe even interfering bodily with him to cause him some discomfort and illnesses and stuff at times as well. So, you know, and it's a bit like, I don't know if you followed the hitchhiker effect, people that are having these encounters with UFOs and stuff. Some of them are taking home, uh, viral type paranormal mm-hmm. events and illnesses and autoimmune diseases, all kinds of stuff. I think that, that, that pro- possibly could be happening to, uh, remote viewers and psychics on some level as well. It's almost it's it seems to support this idea that that there's this branch of the tech tree that can be built up around this ability and and somehow we've completely missed it. And it's almost yeah. like it seems like magic to us, but it'd be like if we took AI back to World War Two yes. and used it against the Germans, they'd think well, these people are crazy. Absolutely, yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah, uh, I think that's pretty much where we are. Interesting. And I've said I've said many times if. If you know, if I could just get a billionaire to spend fifty, you know, twenty million dollars on a ten-year project to to look at how you could use remote viewers and psychic ability to to access all parts of uh, all parts of everything we ever want to know about UAPs and everything, you know, with the technology we have nowadays and the communication technology and stuff. 10, 20 million dollars uh, and some of the best public remote viewers in the world on a 10 year project. The amount of things, the amount of damage I could do out there, it would be, would be shocking. Um, but they're just, they're just, it's just not being done right now. I, I feel like that's a project that could be crowdfunded. And I feel like there would be enough people. I mean, I look at uh, David Grush goes on Joe Rogan and it gets 11 million views. You know, it's, it, yeah. it, there's so yeah. many people that have come on board. And I think everyone is pretty much, on board with the idea that there's something huge going on. We're yeah. just, we're not able to get at it. Yeah. As I, as I shown you with my remote viewing session, a remote viewer can go anywhere. 
Yeah, and I haven't shown you the remote viewer in sessions where you know I've decided to find one of these life forms and go inside in, in almost inside. I'm not really going inside their head, but you know I'm kind of going inside the information about their head and their thoughts, their and their and their beings and what they're doing and having almost like having a communication. I'm not really having a communication. I'm just accessing the universal information about what they may have thought at one point. It's out there in the universe somewhere. Store. I, that, that was a specific question I had. There was a case that I found. Uh, you you talked about, I think, with uh, Jeffrey Mishlove about uh, Phoenix Lights. The Phoenix Lights, yeah. We went, myself and Dick Haugar, we both almost had like, not really communications, but we went inside the kind of uh, consciousness of, of the life forms and, and, yeah, got information from that about what they were doing, their aims, their goals, all that kind of stuff. And what did you learn? That's, Oh, to, I have to be honest. That was several years ago, so I can't. I've, I, you know, I'm doing three, or, three or four of these a week at the moment. So it all melt for me. It all, I, I literally have to go back and look through what I wrote at the time because it all just like, melds into mm. one big pot for me nowadays. Um, yeah, so I can't remember too much on that. Dick, Dick did more than I did on, on that case. To, to, I've done other cases, like, I, like for example, uh, I did. And again, there's a video online. I have a channel called. Uh, I don't know if you know this, um, a remote viewed on, on YouTube, hundreds and hundreds of, of videos on there of me interviewing the top people in remote viewing. But not only that, I also put some of my biggest uh, remote viewing projects on there. And what you can actually see, you can actually see, for example, the Phoenix Lights, um, Area 51 and Roswell, where I'm actually doing the remote viewing live on a whiteboard with a video camera videoing me as I'm doing it. Again, all blind, so I don't know what the target is. So you actually see me in live, real time getting the data. And you'll see, like, when I looked at, for example, Area 51, I didn't know I was looking at Area 51, but I knew I was looking, obviously, because I could see the, the levels of an underground facility. But the shocking realization of the the weapons they were making uh, based on alien technology that i saw in, in that facility and it's not it wasn't just physical weapons it was um chemical and biological weapons from from some of the bodily fluids and stuff like that that they got from from these beings that were being made was was qu was quite shocking i uh so, I, I recently saw uh a clip of an interview um oh man who was it um I'll have to find it, but it was someone uh, who was saying that the program is actually a lot less well-funded than people suspect it is, and it's much smaller than people have have, have Wouldn't learned. Surprise me. Is, do, do you know if that's if there's truth to that? Um, I've also I heard that they've had that. a lot more trouble making progress than it's like a lot of the misinformation is about how far we've actually come. In fact, they, yeah. they, they may yeah. not have made very much progress at all. It, from what I've seen, and I'm, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but what I've seen, it looks, uh, it looks, uh, it looks like what happened with the remote viewing program in that they tried to keep it so secret that, uh, by keeping everyone detached and, and compartmentalized, uh, it, it, it actually hindered the progress of mm. science and information more than more than helping. Um, um, I know everyone out there on the on the circuit, and you know, most of us have looked at uh, or been tasked to look at because we're doing it blind. You know what? Generally, what's happening with the American side of of UAP research and this kind of stuff. Um, but I can only imagine what's been going on in in other countries like China and Russia and stuff that we you know we as remote viewers as far as I'm aware, haven't even been asked to look at to see what's going on there. But, you know, someone with the money uh, to, to put into tasking remote viewers to spend a few weeks to do it, and it's pretty low cost, you know. Uh, each remote viewer paying them a few hundred dollars each to, to do this kind of thing as a research tool. You know, we're not asking much as remote viewers, just enough to, like, you know, live on like everyone else. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a tool that's massively undervalued uh, at this moment in time. Hopefully, in the future, people use it. Uh, as I said, I, I do work for certain people. Uh, we do work for our subscribers mm. as well. And I put out public projects like on Hellfire and stuff as well, as much as I possibly can. Um, but yeah, remote viewing can go anywhere in time and space and it's being underused on a, on a, on a thing like UAPs. But hypothetically, if the community at large wanted to organize itself and, and crowdfund yeah. a group of remote viewers to just provide yeah. their data and make it public, they could do that. That's There's nothing stopping. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
uh, we all know that you know one of the top scientists involved in this at the moment is uh, Gary Nolan, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, he's looking into the all kinds of the UAP stuff. I can only imagine the amount of informational damage I could get if, if for example, he was working with us, tasking us on projects with like a group of you know funded like about eight of us to lurk, work for you know several months attacking one one solution to bring back information you know in my head i can just I, I salivate at the idea of what we could bring back and then working with someone like him who was a credible scientist who would know how to interpret the information against his question for example you know if he wanted to know how a certain propulsion system worked on such and such mm. something that he would you know he would know what we were describing as viewers but i don't have a clue on what i'm describing but because he, he's so high up uh, at the chain and, you know, he's so um, intelligence-wise credible, he'd be able to interpret and make use of, of the data that we'd be providing. Do, do remote viewers have a presence with the Soul Foundation at all? Um, I don't think so. One of my colleagues went to their recent talks and asked him if they thought about using uh, remote viewers, and half of them said yes and half of them said no. Huh. It's interesting because yeah. it seems like there's enough of a history with Stanford that there should be a little bit of goodwill there. Again, but not everyone believes mm. in in the validity of it of it still, even though there's you know huge amounts of background records out there to to support you know the weight of what we can do as remote viewers. Is, um, is there something there, you could think of, or, or would this be maybe a larger project to, to think to plan out? But is there like do you have a project in mind that if you were able to like get the funding to do it, you could put put this thing to rest and like we could find out where one of the craft is stored and we could go there and and locate it or or we could quite easily like find out where they are. Yeah. Um but the only problem is is acting upon that information to prove it. Right. Like, you know, uh why well, I, I, I think swore. my mind goes to the the Ross Coltart story about the the one that was so big they put a building over it. But we should yeah. I, we should be able to spot that building from Google Maps. Uh, you should, but even if you find a building, uh, you don't know that there's a craft inside it until someone goes in there and finds the craft inside well, it. Well, yeah, there's that, that that component. But but hypothetically, it would at least point I, you, like we would get all eyes looking on the same target yes, at that point. Hypothetically, uh, that, that would be very possible to do. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, as I said, at, at this point in time, over you know, remote viewing has been gone going on since seventy two, um, and I you know I've been researching this myself for twenty seven years. I've read everything out there possible, and experienced that there are no hindrances to what we can do with remote viewing. Although I will caveat that with some of the non humans seem to have some kind of ability to disturb what we do. As remote viewers, so I would like- we're talking about a, we're talking about a life form there that we know from abductee and other experiences. They have a capacity with their mind that seems to outweigh our ability somewhat in that. So that, yeah, yeah, like we're we're evolving to come out of the water and exist on land, but we're not really there yet. They've been living on land for thousands yes. of years. They although, have- as I yeah. said, we might we might have the true ability to do that, but some of it. Uh, sociologically, have been kept away from us. Do, do you under think control. is is there That's a kind of, is, is there a case? I'm sorry to talk over you. I'm just excited by the the kind of the direction that this leads in because it seems to me like um it, it, one could have like a Jedi Academy for people to yeah. to basically develop their mental abilities, yeah. and you could I mean if you took 500 Buddhist monks and you put them in a room and, and gave them, and you had a, a billion dollars in 10 years, could you turn yeah. them into, does that make sense? Like turn them into some Jedi Knights yeah. and then we actually have like our, our yes. ninja team. Yes. That's a very ham handed way of saying what I'm trying no, to say. Absolutely. I think you understand. Yeah. As I said, like the people I work with in, in how far the ones that I've personally curated and I work with on a regular basis or the ones in my, you know, my, the company I work for future forecasting mm. group, there's five in there as well. Um, they're the you know the best the best of the best you know they're week after week month after month they hit target after target after target um and they're they're improving you know we all we're all improving is it's not something that you ever stop at you always learn a little bit more 
Yeah, the uh, it's just an underused at this moment in time. It's an underused and, and misunderstood skill that UAP wise isn't being used to to the kind of things that it could do. It could it could crack any solution uh, working with a with a hardcore team of people that would be able to to validate the information and, and act upon the information. That's the key to it. I imagine it might be uh, one particular area that that would be useful. Or, or, or RV would be especially useful for would be crop circles because they're so yeah, specific yeah. and so visual. Would that, would yeah. you think, has and, anyone uh, looked at that? I've seen several ad hoc projects and I've run a couple of ad hoc projects myself, but we're talking like a single project with each viewer spending an hour or so on it, you know. Mm-hmm. Whereas the kind of thing I'm really talking about is, you know, a proper project with project managers working teams of remote viewers for weeks on end to get like, you know, a book of information that, you know, very specific answers to what scientists want to know, you know, you know, like, you know, working with someone like Gary Nona or something who might want to know what, what the, I don't know what the, what the molecule or the fuel is Mm -hmm. to fuel a certain thing. You know, so, so try and say to get the remote viewer to describe everything, you know, the craft, the occupants, this, that, there, really specifically getting them to hone in like, you know, like a honing kind of laser on a single question and really answer that scientifically. Like the, uh, McDonnell Douglas, uh, researchers you mentioned earlier on like you could figure out yes. maybe how an alloy is is composed or, or you yes. could work out the, the way yes. a system maybe functions or interacts so then you Absolutely. could back engineer or overcome some kind of research yeah. hurdle yeah Interesting. so yeah. you know to, to put on the context of your crop circles of yeah myself and a few other people have ad hoc for an hour at a time looked at crop circle stuff uh-huh. but and i'm finding some really interesting stuff but nothing that i would say is the complete full unabridged picture because you know we just haven't had the t- you know cause we're all work you know we're all working everyday jobs to, you know yeah so it just sure. needs to focus but I, I, on the crop circle front um from 1989 to to I think 1995 uh, being from the UK here uh, and only 20 minutes from the crop circle center I spent many years of myself actually. In inside and outside of those crop circles, uh, and in some cases, I I found crop circles, and I was the very first person inside of crop circles as well. I was going to say, it seems like that would be the kind of thing that you could you could predict where it's going to be, roughly what it's going to look like, and then you could go there and verify it and see it, fly a drone over I it. Don't know that about that because we didn't. Yeah, you know, none of us were doing remote viewing way back in the sure. in the nineties when that was happening. Um, Yes, but it would be possible nowadays, although there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of what I call faking activity nowadays mm. in, involved. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I was involved in crop circle research way back in the uh, 89 period. And in fact, I even have samples from some of the uh, 1989 crop circles, the big ones of the day, actually here, it's sealed up in, in containers. Wow. Um, I, I know that, that that was a lot of the stuff that Linda Moulton Howe was working on. Uh, in, yes, in her I, 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 did, I did see her occasionally in the area. She was she frequented the, the, the barge in pub where everyone else met. In, oh, that's funny. Uh, of an evening. Yeah. So she was there. She was there most evenings as well. Um, how are you on time, by the way? Because we're coming up on two hours and I have a couple more questions. Uh, I, I'm okay for a, a little bit longer if you want. Yeah. Okay. I, I have a few audience questions that were really, people were very specific about these. They wanted me to work okay, these in. Yep. Um, the, the first is the Pat Price, um, connection. Uh, 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 can you sort of flesh out the story about Pat Price and the, uh, I understand that he located some bases and this may yep. tie into what you were talking about, about interference. Can you kind of flesh that picture out a little bit? <laughs> uh, or am I putting I you on the spot? Um, I don't want to do that. Uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah. Pat Price was, um, he was one of the best viewers in the seventies. Um, I would say he was the best viewer, very accurate. Um, you know, he, well, accurate wise, he was just astounding. You know, he'd be able to look inside a filing cabinet and read, read the, uh, a project name on a document. For example, he was that accurate. Um, there are rumors that he was murdered. Uh, I think that's pretty much out there in the third I spies documentary by, by Targ. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's good evidence to support that. Um, I think he made some mistakes at the time because he was a very, uh, a very ardent 
uh, Scientologist. So I think he made the mistake of in Scientology, you have to debrief with people every, every day or so. Mm. Uh, and he made the mistake of telling Scientology, everything that was going on at SRI. Um, so stuff then leaked about what was going on to the Russians and stuff. Uh, and there, and he was doing all kinds of stuff as well. He was actually able to pick up Russian communications and stuff. So I think that there was good reason why some people probably bumped him off and got rid of him, uh, shortly after he went to work directly for the CIA in the, in the early seventies. But before all that happened, yeah, he did, he did decide one day to just look and see what was happening with the UFO problem on the, on the earth. And he found, uh, four, four bases, uh, in remote parts of the planet. Uh, and he detailed those, um, a few months ago, uh, a, f- a colleague of mine came to me and said that he'd also acquired uh, even more Pat Price stuff, which was a 47 page unreleased document that came direct from Harry put off that Harry had been keeping secret for 50 years, um, which was even more in depth Pat Price stuff. Uh, I had that and um, it's not been released yet, but it will be very soon. Um, and bearing in mind, we're talking about possibly the most accurate psychic or remote viewer of our time. He goes very, very in depth into what's happening with the, and this is 1972 Mm -hmm. uh, of the, of the UFO situation as it was in 1972. And he details two warring uh, kind of ET races that are fighting over dominance of the planet. He details where they are, how they, how even if you're a psychic and you psychically look at their bases, they can then ping you and track you using any, he actually draws and describes the technology that they use to track you. Um, what else did he go? He even details later in the document, um, how they trap in like the Bermuda triangle area, how they, uh, freeze the flight of the craft and the, and the boats, kidnap the people, take, take them physically away, kill some of them. Some of them, they, kill on the spot some of them they actually transport live by by uh doing medical experiments on their heart and lungs to make them movable in some way so he de- and again this is 1972 he's detailing all this and what else does he he also details and there's this uh, this might be some reasons why it's not been released so far he details every facet of human society science financial uh, military political uh, and how they've been infiltrated by certain non-humans to keep us in a perpetual state of conflict with each other so that we're thinking about fighting each other and we're not we're looking in the direction of what they're doing. And he actually names uh, these departments, you know, in like finance, banking, religion and everything, and who is, who is an infiltrator type, hybrid type person and stuff. This is a really interesting... Uh dimension in the ufo conversation because this comes up a lot and i think it's one of the really um it it, there there seems to be a resistance to talk about uh abductions the uh what what is described as the hybrid program this was talked about a lot more in the 90s in the late 80s and then it seems like that conversation abruptly comes to a stop yeah. And we've picked back up with craft and reverse engineering and government uh, re- retrieval programs. But the question remains, like at one time, a lot of people were saying that there was a huge there there. And John Mack's probably yeah. the best best example of someone yes. of a high yeah. stature who was looking very seriously at this. What do you make of the abduction phenomenon, hybridization? Is there a there there from what you gathered? Or is this all just like, you know, interesting stories? No, but Again, it's not, I don't think it's as black and white as we think. Uh, I, I don't know exactly why they're doing it and who's doing it, but at least some of them are doing those kind of, you know, some of them do treat us like we treat cows. Mm-hmm. You know, as they said to me in some of the RV sessions I've done, you know, we're, we're like, a, we're like a, a, a farmyard to them. But it seems like a, farm the, the, what you described, uh, the, the Pat Price uh, uh, scenario that you just described is very much like yeah. they live. 
Like th- that's, it's like yes. our society yeah. is basically like, that's the thing people can't handle is that it's actually yes. all just. And as I said, he wrote that in 1972 and, uh, and yeah. I, uh, you know, he even names, you know, I, I've got, I've got the document yet. He names, you know, the head of such and such university, the head of such and such bank, the head of such and such religious organization, hmm. you know, they are working with them, you know, or been infiltrated or, or I don't know if he's, if he's saying they're working with them, I need to clarify this or whether he's actually saying that they are them alien kind of hybrid type beings. In, but that's why I think that how and the others have kept this document secret because yeah. essentially you could go back and look at who those people were and dox them and investigate them and stuff like that. Cause you know, it's very easy to do that kind of thing with the, with the internet now. Did you ever follow any of David Jacobs? Uh, research. I on. did. Yeah, I read all the books. I, yep. Yeah, they they cost me a lot of sleep. I I, I wonder about that because he talks very um, uh, forcefully about the idea that he kept coming across the same pattern again and again and again with yep. all these people that he would work with. That there there's yeah. some kind of a plan. It's uh, it's happening. There's a beginning, a middle, yeah. and an end. And then one of the I think most creepiest thing, the creepiest thing I've heard him say is that. Over and over and over again, he heard people say, "All oh, the change is coming. The change is coming. There's going to be this change." Yeah. But they could never really yeah. get at. I think even Bob Lear talked about this back in the early yeah. or mid '80s. Yeah. Something enormous is going to happen, and these people who have been abducted, and there's probably over a hundred thousand of them, have been given some place to go and something to do. But under our best hypnotic techniques, we cannot find out what it is. These aliens, the gray aliens, would tell the abductees. Soon there's going to be a change. It's going to be wonderful. Oh, it's going to, you're going to love it. The change is coming soon. Soon there's going to be change. Everybody's going to be happy. Everybody's going to know his place. So I'd ask him, well, what do they mean by the change? The abductees did not know. I said, well, what do they mean by soon? It could mean for them 10,000 years from now or 10 minutes from now for all we knew. And they said nobody knew. They didn't know. Abductees did not know. So uh, then abductees would be brought into a room and look at a, a, a screen on the wall, a screen-like device is the best way I can put it. And there's a picture, and these are two actual cases, a picture of a uh, picnic. And it's like a moving picture. There's, there's people who are grilling, you know, there's a, 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 one of those uh, table with benches on it there and, and they're making something on the grill. There's some kids playing ball and they, you know, there's a little lake by it, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is perfectly normal. And they hear in their mind's ears, so to speak, they hear telepathically, can you tell the difference between you and us? And the abductee stares at that screen and says, uh, difference? What do you mean? I don't see any difference. Everybody looks the same. And it's like, they, and they hear this telepathic voice saying, see, isn't that wonderful? Soon we will all be together. Soon everyone will be happy. Then another abductee tells me a story about how she sees this, what looks like a photograph. And it's of people like standing on steps, like a school photograph or something like that, you know, except there's only about a dozen people. And she's staring at this thing, wondering why she's looking at this photograph. And uh, she hears a voice and says, can you tell the difference between us and you? And she says, no, everybody is exactly the same. Once again, same thing. See, isn't that wonderful? Soon everybody is going to be together. Soon everyone uh, will be happy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. Do you have a, an opinion on any of this? Uh Again, uh, I think I think there's very much truth to it. Um, I've, but I don't think it's like all all the non-humans are f- doing and thinking the same thing. Mm-hmm. I think it's you know different agendas from different beings doing different stuff. Um, but at least yeah, at least one or two sets of them seem to be doing that kind of thing. And you know they were even teaching uh, some of these abductees and stuff how to fly the craft in case of emergencies and, and stuff like that, you know, for future, for, for something that's going to happen in the future. Yeah. So you have to wonder what that is, but you know, through removing, we also know that the futures are quite, you know, it's all about probabilities and it's quite fluid. So maybe the event, you know, has happened or not happened or something happened to change the future. You know, it's, I, I don't know what's going on there, but yeah, there is some very interesting stuff going on. And even some of the, uh, abductees talk about how they 
some of their past lives were on other planets living as other alien beings in in war type situations before they were transported to earth and stuff i mean that was in a book called abductions by edith fior mm. which is a stunning book um so it's it's a it's very complex you know and as human beings we we can't quite get the complexity you know we don't like to think of the complexity of it we do like to think black and white good bad but it is vastly more complex than that with so many life forms interacting with each other and with us. I think another common um, uh, topic of discussion that I've heard many times, and I think this was in Terry Lovelace's book, uh, that people will see humans on board these craft, sometimes humans yeah. in uniform and sometimes in uniform that is like American yeah. military uniform. Yeah. Um, have have highly, any, highly possible, yeah. Have yeah. remote viewers looked at that ever? That seems like a really obvious place to look. Not that I know of, um, but it would be a great, great. T- I don't know how you'd start with it because yeah. it'd, be, it'd be good to start with something that you you had enough feedback for you to be assess ac- accuracy. Mm-hmm. Um, so you'd maybe have to look at trying to get the best uh, reported case to see if we can validate what's in that. But you know, it's always better to use, like for example, on the health our projects I do. Um, we always try to use, you know, like, like, you know, I was reading out the examples like, uh, the Tic Tac UFO, for example, that's a great one because we have so much video testimonial evidence to be able to assess against what the remote viewer says to see how accurate we are. Mm. Not, not every UFO case, you know, if, if the UFO case is just like a light in the sky, then that's not anything worth working because you can't validate any of the information against the feedback. I see. So you have to be careful what you choose, but yes, um, it's quite possible you could run remote viewers against one of those type projects. Like uh, I did do a project with some of the viewers. I don't know if we published it on a, it was a couple of years, not even a couple of years ago. I did it recently on a, um, a set of, of cattle mutilation cases mm. in Texas. The most recent cattle mutilation cases in Texas. A couple of years ago. They, right? Two, three, two, and, three. Yeah. And they, they all had some very, uh, overlapping in interesting data about non-human beings involved in doing experimentation on, on animals in the field. Uh, it, it seems like it's uh, not just cattle, but other animals as well. And then I've heard there are even rare cases yeah. of humans. Uh, you you, yeah, you, yeah, you seem to, in, in, if I may, in, in some of your interviews, you seem to allude to there's, there is definitely a dark side to the phenomenon. That- oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and even as, as in, I, uh, I knew this anyway because I've been interested in UAP research for years. So I've seen many, uh, I've seen some pictures and some documents and some alluding towards human mutilations. And I was even involved in um, some UAP research in the uh, 90s Mm. here in the UK where we managed to get an SAS source that started telling us that he was doing uh, cleanup operations after abduction and UAP events where he was cleaning up the remains of humans that have been killed and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I've got a history that goes back quite a few years with this kind of stuff that I've, that I've been picking up. Uh, and you know, within remote viewing, there are, there are hints at stuff like that as well. So there is a, you know, some, someone out there, I don't know if it's aliens or interdimensionals or whatever, there is at least one form of non-humans it does treat us a bit like, and you know, we can't be that too bad about it because we, it's only the same way as we treat cows. Do you know what I mean? You know, we, will, we will go people. into a field and yeah, yeah we'll, we'll inject a cow, we'll like yeah. rope it up, we kill it on the spot, take it home, cut it up for beef, all that kind of mm-hmm. thing. They're just, they're just treating us how they think we are on the chain. Like we, we treat other animals, you know, we all treat, you know, well, we don't all treat it, but you know, the majority of the human race treats animals in a really bad way, you know, because we think we're more dominant. Yeah. It's just that there's a, there's a more dominant species than us that treats us like like we treat other animals. I um, I wonder, but not all of them. Sure, no, that, that and I think that's what's frightening is because we, when we really think about how we treat animals, I think we all know it's yeah. Not. But there are there are some beings out there, physical, non physical, alien, or I don't I don't know what they're, or maybe they're all of those. Uh, that do treat you know do treat us however they 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 see fit as, as science kind of medical kind of things to to do what they want with. Do you think there's anything to the um, 
uh, discussion around some kind of event. It seems like we've heard this a lot in the last few years that there's something uh, pushing this disclosure process forward at a certain, you know, accelerated rate. Uh, well, some that's kind a good of an, question. an end point that we're going to get to where we're all going to know that day when it happens that yeah, we're there. Um, Oh, that's a good question. I, it's not anything I've been asked to remote view to look at. Um, but remote viewing wise, uh, myself and others have inadvertently come across data that indicates that very soon in the future, there's going to be some very big c- catastrophic global changes. I don't know if that means that they'll, that'll intercede with UAP stuff mm-hmm. or, or anything, but. So I, I don't know, you know, the full extent of it. Uh, um, so I don't know if UAP related, to be honest, but I do know that there are, uh, there are some very big global changes on the very near horizon. When you say very near, I have to ask, like, what does that mean? Like, how would you? In terms of years, uh, I'd be surprised if we went past five years with it. Five years? Maybe even closer. Do you see these as, um, natural uh earth changes or some type of a nuclear conflagration or it seems uh it doesn't uh the the data that i'm seeing doesn't seem to indicate you know because we've had some experiences on future forecasting where we've accidentally started describing some of these events um and they don't seem to be natural they seem to be based around um we, we were getting a lot of nuclear type data with it uh, one specific. And we were getting this just b- weeks before the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict started, and then that started. There's a and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a lot of really um, biblical vibes. I do know as well. I do know uh, that some of the uh, how best to say this without saying any names. Some of the most prominent people that have put money into UAP research and maybe ranch research and other things that have lots of money, lots and lots of money are also uh, convinced by some of the data they've been given that something very catastrophic is going to happen in the U S within the next five years. Would this be well. connected to why Mark Zuckerberg's building like a two hundred million dollar underground bunker? Well, you yeah, it, that's that seems very coincidental. That, and I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about people that are, are UAP mysteries based that are putting money into researching because they've been told or they've seen indicated in psychic predictive data and stuff that something is on the near horizon, uh, and they're looking they're looking to try to Hone, hone in on the, the date and time for it. Uh, is, is this Bob Bigelow? Is it one of those people? Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, I wasn't going to mention any names, I, okay. but you did. I, I, I've seen an interview with Bob where, where he, uh, okay. he says, in a, he, well, he, I'll just say he appears very somber in the interview. And I'll leave it there. Uh, well, now you mentioned it. Yeah I, yeah. I know for a fact that they are funding and looking into, and they're very seriously um they have very serious information about a a near term catastrophic US event that they're very seriously investigating. Um I so I, I mean what what do you think people should do with that information? Like that's that's something oh, that is tough to really process. Like how do you how do you yeah. fit that into your day? Let me just ask you into personally. In my day I try to keep I I try to look as much as I can uh, with remote viewing into what's going on future wise, but you know, it, by being as blind as possible, mm. I'm not trying to be influenced, you know, because I've heard that I'm trying not to, to look and force for something. Um, I also keep an eye on all the news to see what's happening. And I try to be as prepared as I can for s- stuff like, you know, having, you know, I tell people, you know, you, you'd have to be crazy in today's society not to have a couple of months worth of supplies of everything in your house, just just in case. It costs hardly anything. Just do it just in case. It's weird. If COVID, if COVID taught me anything, you know, in the UK here when mm-hmm. you couldn't get anything because the shelves were stripped of everything, COVID yeah. taught me that, you know, you need to be 
at least minimally re- uh, prepared for for a few weeks worth of, of turmoil at any at any point in time. I, so I remember that would be the most basic. New York during that time, and it was the closest thing to a zombie movie you can imagine. Yeah. It's like there's just no one. You go outside, there's no one, and it's like the 28 yeah. days yeah. later, and it's just. <laughs> a flock of yep. birds flies away and you're just like where is everybody this is really really yeah. weird and it's uh there's some very spooky vibes uh if i look yeah. at the news too long it gives me very spooky vibes there it's weird because you know we start picking up stuff and you know we uh within future forecrossing group we actually uh had stuff very early on that we, well we had stuff a year in advance that indicated the covid stuff but we didn't know what we were seeing because mm. you know, we were getting data we were like tasked to look at the New York parade in, 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 New, you know, in New York, you know, the Macy's day parade, mm-hmm. whatever it is. And we were like, well, there is no parade. There's nothing happening. We, we didn't get any parade data, but we didn't know what to do. We didn't know that it was unheard. Lockdowns were unheard of, you know, no yeah. one knew. So we got all that stuff in advance, but we didn't know what to do. So we didn't publish it. Um, so you can like see the shadow an event will cast without actually being able to see the event. The weird, yeah. The weird thing is some of these events are so big and so mm-hmm. massive and so luminous that uh, they 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 attract us more than the target we're meant to be working on. And this happened just before the, the Palestine Israel thing for several weeks uh, in future forecasting. We were tasked by our our group, our project managers to look at a future medical technology that would save lives. Uh, but all five remote viewers didn't describe that. We all described a, an event of a war starting mm. uh, and, and, and a war that would then escalate to be something even, even more warlike and bigger. And, and we, so we report that. And then our project manager said, no, no, you all missed. Here's the target again. Mm. Go back and have a look at it again. So we did it again. We all missed it again. And this never happens. We all missed it again, and we all report the exact same things again, which is a war type stuff, and then a bigger nuclear type war. Um, that happened three times, and it, it, we've never done that in the five year history of of, of doing. How future far forecasting. out were you trying to look where you ran into this wall? Um, I can't remember. Only something like about ten years or something. So is this like? But, are you suggesting that there's a? A barrier beyond which, like an no, event no, takes I'm, place what, that that we can't. What see. I'm saying is, they tasked us to look at a mundane target of looking at some kind of future medical technology, but there's there was a series of events that were so luminous, so close that we were attracted by those, and we went and reported those more than the you know, the other event because that's what happens with remote viewing is the more interesting, the more moving, the more luminous event attracts you more than anything else is it fair to say as i try to wrap my mind around this that that in in the way you're describing this it sounds like in the future of all possible probabilities there are clouds of probability that are much more um much denser and where there's more a much higher likelihood of an event happening it's not necessarily saying that that is a guarantee but it's such a big potential yeah. Um, what happens with remote viewing as well is the best targets or the targets that attract the remote viewers most are the targets with the most entropy, mm. which is entropy is like the most changed, the most information, the most, you know, they're like the biggest, noisiest, brightest, noisiest, changing global type type things. So we start picking out this stuff and then we, so literally we put out this stuff. We, we, we don't usually put this kind of stuff out because we don't know what to do, but we mm. did actually put out there. Okay. We think, we think conflicts on the horizon, something big is going to happen. And then like four weeks later, the Palestine and Israel thing started, which confirmed a lot of our data because, you know, because we actually then had feedback so we could say, okay, this is exactly what we were sketching. Mm. But some of the other stuff, 50% of the stuff that we were sketching the really big stuff we're talking and we were getting lots of hardcore nuclear type stuff. So this would be, that, yeah, hasn't come to pass. This would be similar to like the person, the example we looked at earlier of the person who could do echolocation with a clicker, they're walking around and then suddenly like a police siren goes off and a giant truck drives by it's, it's clouding the space and they can't net. So as, as a remote viewer, you can't necessarily look past that. You're, you're so it's almost, do you get sucked into the sort of the gravity of that event? Is that kind of how? It goes? Yeah, because uh, there's a part of us in the process that wants to be not us, but there's part of us within the RV process that's all 
want it wants interesting things it doesn't like boredom mm. so when it sees something big and luminous and that affects the entire globe on the horizon you know a few weeks away it gets more attracted to that like a moth to a light than it does to you know if the target's a tiny little light over here sure. with hardly any interest at all you know so if, if the main target was a medical thing in the future over here and it's a tiny little light in the distance because it's not going to affect many people and it's not really interesting. But then it sees this big, you know, a few weeks of bay, a big uh, event that's going to change millions of people's lives. There's going to be bombs, you know, emotions, all this interest in that. You, you, you know, there's a part of you goes, well, that's more interesting over there. I'm going to go see what that is. And it goes to that instead. Do you have the sense, uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot, and I, I'm not holding you to this, but do you have the sense that the Israeli uh, Palestinian situation, does this, explode into something much larger or does this resolve itself all, all i can say is approximately half our data has been confirmed that we saw mm. uh, but bear in mind again oh, this has never happened to us before all remote all the remote viewers reported nuclear type data that's creepy and that hasn't and that hasn't happened yet that's really creepy though and it didn't just happen to once we got sent back to the same target three times because they were like come on guys you're, you're off target why are you off all, all of you go back, redo it. You're saying and across it, the remote viewing community at large, you are as a as an expert, subject matter expert in this field, and a practitioner yourself, and and being in contact with a, a number of remote viewers around the world. You're saying that all of them are running into the same. Not no, not all of them. I I will clarify though that. I once we published the stuff, I did have people approach me on Facebook and stuff and say. Weirdly, we're getting the the same or similar data coming up in our RV. I had at least two groups doing that. Okay, and and also independently, um, a year before that, I ran into, as I said, the well, you've mentioned the name Bigelow Group. Mm -hmm. Were also independently looking at uh, a big, but their event is US based. They're they're thinking there's a they they're some. Other people, not uh, not me as remote viewers, but other psychics or intuitives uh, had indicated to them of a big catastrophic U.S. event in in the near future. Yeah. So there are lots of people out there picking up very catastrophic, luminous uh, psychic events or probable events, I should say. Yeah. Um, in in what I would class as the as the near future that we're all we're all slightly worried about looking looking at and to be, tentatively to clear to be clear the near future we're talking about ten years or less yes more or less yes. okay um, maybe yeah yeah yes okay I've kept you almost half an hour over I, I, if I may I want to throw one more question at you from the audience yeah yeah I, go first yeah. really, I had a bunch of people ask me what can you tell us about Antarctica is there something <laughs> big going on there what do you know I. RV, well, I mean, you know, I've obviously seen all the rumors and looked at it, it, it normally, uh, and it does, there's something there, but RV wise, I've only been tasked to look at it once or twice, and it wasn't a very big project. It was only like have a quick hour long glance, and we did see some, um, uh, some facilities and man made structures underneath the ice that were doing weird stuff. Um, I can't remember the depth of what though. And as I said, it was, it, it wasn't, you know, that's the shame with some of this stuff is I don't get given enough, uh, uh, a time to look at things. It's like, cause you know, like when we're doing it in future forecasting, we're doing like three of these a week and it's like, okay, you do it. You'd spend a couple of hours on it, move on. Let's get the next bit of content out. Um, see, yeah. so it's one of those things that I think there's definitely something there. Something, I don't know what's going on, but it looks like something that's, uh, definitely has some kind of military component to it, but there's might be something more than that as well, because the, the motion of some of the vehicles seem to be UAP, UAP type based. Mm -hmm. But I have to be totally honest in that any of the work we've done has been very preliminary and it would need a proper project to look at it. But has anybody, it like there's something I, I'm sorry to jump in, but this just popped in there. Has anybody ever looked at any of Gary McKinnon stuff, the NASA hacker who, who supposedly. Not that I'm aware of. No, not RV wise. No. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. 
again, is do you know what I mean? Yeah. As as I said, if 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 someone had the funding to get remote viewers to look at this on a serious basis, I feel like it's such a slam dunk to get the UFO community to crowdfund. Like I feel like that is going to happen some sooner or later. Someone's going to organize that. As I said, you know, um, my, my colleagues and I, as I said, I we put out as much as we can on like uh, Hellfire. You know, there's a there's a there's a good wealth of stuff on there. I mean, anyone is interested, I definitely recommend you look at the Whitley Streber implant one and. The kind of stuff we saw, at, um, what was going on at the the Skinwalker Ranch with the hitchhiker effect and how that happened. I mean, the in-depth information we got on that, where we tracked the portals that were being created, who was creating them, what they were doing, all that kind of stuff is really interesting. But you know, that's me and a few colleagues doing this on a on a non-paid for ad hoc ad hoc basis. But I'm trying to use the best remote viewers that I can find on the public circuit to do that. Are you familiar with any of the research that's being done on uh, DMT? Uh, the people who maybe, there's a group I, I know uh, that is doing um, DMT like drips and they're basically mm-hmm. trying yeah. to send people into hyperspace for a period of time and then have them come back with yeah. data. Have you heard anything about that? I've, I've seen, you know, I've seen articles and interviews, that kind of stuff on TikTok and all that kind of stuff, but I, I haven't explored it myself because I, I can, you know, I can do all that kind of stuff without <laughs> any drug. Yeah. As I said, my first book, uh, Surfing the Psychic Internet, was uh, I was part of a, it wasn't remote viewing back then, it was a circle kind of psychic development channeling group where we spent 12 years going, creating a portal and going off into hyperspace to communicate with non-human entities for 10 years. Wow. I uh, For people who are not, uh, as as up to speed on this and want to learn more, what is the best uh, resource that you can direct them to for the beginner and the layman? Oh, yeah, if it's remote viewing, and you know, I would have to say my site is one of the, the best out there because I have so much information on there for free that they can look at, and there's even like free templates showing you, you know, that you could use with videos and a, and a form you can fill in to try your remote viewing. I have practice targets, and video, you know, hundreds of videos, that kind of thing. So. I would say my remote viewed website is a good starter resource. And also the remote viewed uh, YouTube channel that I started during uh, COVID lockdown, people couldn't meet. So I started doing a Friday night discussion where I managed to get hold of the, the best people in the field of remote viewing, including all the top scientists and, and military remote viewers. Um, and we interviewed them for several hours at a time and put all the videos up for free. So they're absolutely packed with huge amounts of information from people that have been doing this for decades. Wow, that is fascinating. I um, so there's a lot of resources out there for people who are interested in learning more. And oh yeah, I mean yeah, if anyone wants to know what the military did, you know, we have interviews with Joe McMahon Eagle, who's Remote Viewer Zero Zero One, who's classed as the best remote viewer in the world. There's interviews with him on there. Uh, Ed, Doctor Ed May, he he as actually director of the Stargate Remote Viewing Program for the last five or six years of its life, but he also started in there in the 70s. Mm. So he spent 30 years doing this for the American you know, N- government, NSA, all that kind of stuff. There's interviews with all those people and they're spinning the beans on every aspect. I, uh... Dr. Red May, for example, goes into great detail about visiting the Russians and seeing how much better their, the Russian remote viewing uh, projects were than, than the US. Were they significantly better? significantly better significantly more funded significantly more people yeah wow i uh i wonder it's hardly talked about hardly anyone knows about it or 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 anything you know it's it's just gone do you think these programs are still going on in in a a classified way being funded it seems like it must be right yeah until a year ago i couldn't find any evidence everywhere and trust me i looked Mm. being a historian i looked everywhere but i have now uh over the last year had some of the top people who should know and who would know actually confirmed to me off the record that there is there is projects going on yeah i can't imagine there wouldn't be but you know it, it would be like the uap programs now it would be um corporations doing it in special access type programs and it probably wouldn't even be called remote viewing it probably be called something like strategic intelligence gathering or something Some boring name that no one would ever look yeah at. yeah so yeah. It, no one knows what it is and it just looks like it's human intelligence or something Truly fascinating. Daz, thank you so much for carving out the time to have this conversation. I've kept you half an hour longer than I promised I would. and it, It's been great fun. And yeah, let's do it again sometime. Just hit me up. I would love to. Thank you so much. I'll let you get back to it. And... Um...